Alrighty, good afternoon and welcome to the Public Safety Committee's Fiscal 2021 Preliminary Budget Hearing. Today we will hear testimony from Police Commissioner Shea and his staff on the Police Department's budget. Uh, before I get into my testimony, we're joined by Council Members Deutsch, uh, Cabrera, Lanceman, and Rosenthal. Uh, and I will begin now. The Department's capital plan totals $1.6 billion for fiscal year 2020 through fiscal year 2024. We would like to hear the progress of facility developments and renovations for the Special Victims Division, Crime Lab and Toe Pounds, as well as upgrades for technology projects like the Discovery Lab and Domain Awareness System. The preliminary budget made almost no changes to the NYPD's bottom line. However, the November financial plan added new budgetary needs of $38 million and 357 new positions. Today we will discuss the 21 million and 250 positions added to comply with criminal justice reforms, 10 million and 88 positions for homeless outreach and engagement, and 3 million and 29 positions for mental health co-response teams. And although this year's preliminary budget does not add any additional positions, it also does not cut any positions. Right now, the NYPD's workforce totals 52,000 personnel, which makes NYPD the second largest city workforce behind only the Department of Education. We will examine the department's baseline budget and how its 52,000 staff are deployed. We are here to discuss the NYPD's strategy and efficiency in employing, in employing these personnel to keep our city safe. And while we are gracious for their sacrifices, we can never be satisfied. Some crime indicators increased this last calendar year, including murders, shootings, robberies, and hate crimes. The budget does not show us everything. There are programs, initiatives, and policy decisions that are not made clear through this budget. But by learning about how the department allocates its costs, we can make sure strategies are focused on the right things and are done the right way. As technology advances, government must ensure transparency and accountability. This last year, we have seen troubling developments in new areas. We recently had a hearing on DNA collection and storage by the NYPD and are concerned about the department's infring infringement on innocent citizens' civil liberties. Facial recognition software is also changing how police departments across the country are investigating cases. And while it may aid in solving some crimes, there is a balance between acceptable usage and of disregarding our rights to privacy. These concerns also tie in with historic racial disparities in criminal justice. During the last commissioner's tenure, dishonest stop and frisk practices came to an end. However, the legacy of stop and frisk is not dead, but transferred to uneven methods of investigation, prosecution, and more. The raise the age policy amended outdated laws that preceded juveniles as adults, but we must ensure the NYPD has the funds to support processing these juveniles the right way. Just last month in Queens, two teenagers were cuffed to a bench in a precinct overnight and through the next day. This is not how raise the age is supposed to work. If capital improvements need to be made, let's make them and not wait around for another horrific story like this one. Now, I want to welcome, we do have a new commissioner, Commissioner Shea, representing a new period in the New York Police Department. We look forward to hearing from Commissioner Shea about what his priorities will be and how the budget will be adjusted to support those priorities. I'm sure our work together will continue to make our city a safer place and a fairer place. We are encouraged by Commissioner's statements in the Shea's statements in the past few months, but would like to hear his plans for the department as a whole. The New York City Police Department's budget is essentially $6 billion. This fiscal year, it's $5.5 billion, but let's say $6 billion, because if the pass is any indicator, the police department will reach the $6 billion mark soon enough. How will the commissioner manage its budget and use the resources given to the NYPD in the best way possible? That's the question we have. I would also like to thank my staff and the committee staff for their hard work. Thank you to Nevin Singh, to Isha Wright, Casey Addison, Daniel Addis, Josh Kingsley, and Tiffany Easton. And thank you, Commissioner Shea, and to your staff for being here today. So this is your first time uh, testifying before us. Yes, it is. Are you ready? More than ready. <laughs> ready. I'd like to welcome you now as the new commissioner of, of the police department. Thank, thank you, Commissioner Shea. Thank you, thank you, Councilman Richards and all members of the day. And hold on, we're going to swear you in first. 
Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to answer honestly to council member questions? I do. Uh, please state your name for the record if you're going to. Dermot Shea, police commissioner. The rest, the rest of the folks as well. Christine Ryan, deputy commissioner, management and budget. Ben Tucker, first deputy commissioner. Terry Monahan, chief of department. Thank you very much. Councilman Richards, members of the dais, thank you for the opportunity to come here this morning and speak, and thank you for your continued support. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the mayor's preliminary budget for the 2021 fiscal year. It's a pleasure to be here for the first time in my capacity as police commissioner to testify before the Committee on Public Safety about the outstanding work all members of the New York City Police Department are performing every day and night, how we are doing it, and perhaps most importantly, why we are doing it. The why is easy, to keep people safe. And no matter how low we push crime, no matter how safe people actually are or feel, we will always have an obligation to do more. That is our job. And that is what the brave men and women in uniform have promised to do. In fact, that is why the NYPD exists. And so it will remain our critical mission for as long as any of us is here. Before highlighting some key budget items, I will update you on the core mission and several significant public safety initiatives. And I would like to talk to you about policing in New York City in 2020. What it means to us as a police department, to the 8.6 million New Yorkers who live here, to the millions more who commute in for work each day, and to the nearly 67 million more who visit our great city each and every year. When you look at what has been accomplished through neighborhood policing in this city, through, through precision policing, through building trust in our communities, we are in a very good place in New York historically. The next evolution is to do much more regarding kids, the juveniles in this city. And I am not talking necessarily about kids that get arrested. I am talking about all kids. And I can say with great optimism that there is probably not a day that goes by that members of the NYPD do not meet with organizations operating around New York City and outside the criminal justice system that all have the same goals in mind. We have a unique opportunity right now, and it would be a shame if we fail to capitalize on it, to really take a look at the population of kids in New York City and make certain that everything possible is being done to ensure that they do not get into trouble, that they have avenues to express themselves, that they have places to go after school at night or on the weekends. I challenge anyone to give me a better example of where we can invest our money, our resources, and our time. And again, I am not talking just about the police department. I am talking about everyone. So 2020 presents an entire new possibility for us. It is now feasible to think about how we can equip and enable our cops to help kids avoid a first interaction with the criminal justice system. We know the teen years are the vulnerable years, both for the young people likely to be victimized by crimes and the young people likely to commit them. And sometimes kids fall into both categories. From the police perspective, we can chart a course in many of these young lives, from children who flee abusive homes to wind up in the clutches of human traffickers to kids exposed to domestic violence, homelessness, trauma, and other abuse, to the same children a few years later turning to crime. It is not uncommon for us to see kids as young as 16 with 10 to 20 prior arrests, and we have to wonder if we as a city are doing enough to prevent this and other young people from making truly self-destructive choices. I would argue that we are not. We can do far better, both within the NYPD and in coordination with a range of city agencies, private enterprises, and community-based organizations. And that is what the NYPD's new youth strategy is all about. Drawing on our talented, committed personnel and on the accumulated previous encounters with these young people to make a lasting and positive difference in their lives. In establishing and institutionalizing far closer cooperation with our law enforcement partners and community-based service organizations, I believe we can identify the opportunities for intervention with young people early in the progression that risks turning them into criminals or into victims. And what we have to do is organize and focus all of our resources, and there are so many quality programs already in place through the five boroughs so that a troubled kid doesn't go from 12 to 18 without us intervening in a life gone wrong. For us in the NYPD, the first step is to redefine what our NYPD youth officers do. We are establishing a new role in all of our precincts and housing bureau police service areas on the model of our neighborhood coordination officers, called the Youth Coordination Officer. As the title implies, YCOs 
will play a critical coordinating role in maintaining awareness of troubled youth and connecting better and sooner with them and their families. YCOs will also coordinate with other cops and with city agencies and local community groups to see what is available to kids in this city and make sure we are marrying it all up. As I have previously outlined, there are three groups of young people we have to reach. First, for those already far along, unfortunately, on the path to criminality. As it is currently set up, the criminal justice system alone does not do enough to deter them or to help them either. Our YCOs will be fully conversant with these most troubled youth, helping to guide the appropriate criminal sanctions and social service interventions in each and every case. Second, those who are beginning to drift into criminal activity, whether it's shoplifting, stealing from other kids on the street, or other minor crimes. For these kids, we have to bring the full capacities of our social support and service networks into play. The YCOs will be the nexus of this effort, identifying the kids on the cusp of crime, finding the right programs, and making the critical connections. And third, the large majority of young people who aren't committing crimes at all. In fact, some of them may even wind up as victims. We, of course, should be engaging with them as well because it is absolutely the right thing to do. We are determined to breathe new life into existing programs all across the city and to help establish new ones. We envision our new YCOs as the force multipliers who bring people together in every neighborhood, and it is essential for everyone to come to the table and lock arms. And I'm sure that as the afternoon progresses, we will speak to some of the executive team that is working on this. That said, there is clearly no cookie cutter answer to everything in our line of work, but the renewed focus on our city's young people is part of the evolution now as a police department and as a city. And whatever we do, whatever approach we take, it has to always be about all of us sharing that responsibility, strengthening relationships and building trust, working together to reduce crime and violence. And when these things are happening together, when we are building the bridge between the public safety and the public trust, we all win. Let me be clear, we can do this, the NYPD can do this, but only with the rest of the city, can, only with the rest of the city's continued and increased support. The police and the public turning a professional relationship into a true partnership is already fundamentally changing law enforcement, and it is a model for the rest of the nation, quite frankly. Our neighborhood policing crime-fighting philosophy has helped New York buck the crime trends in other large American cities and enabled us to set the standard for effective and, as you said, efficient policing in this country. Clearly, though, we are far from finished. As many of you remember during the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, there were people in New York City who believed we would never get to where we are today. They believed that high crime and sustained fear while walking down the street was just the way it was and always would be. In some neighborhoods, violent crime, unfortunately, was a daily occurrence. In the first half of 1993, for example, in the 75 precincts, 5.5 square miles, someone was killed there an average of once every 63 hours. And that occurred even as brave, dedicated NYPD cops took violent criminals and illegal guns off the street every night. Instead of throwing their hands in the air, however, our police officers, your police officers, refused to believe there was nothing to be done about the state of things. They refused to accept life in the city could not change for the better. They knew that reversing decades-long trend of rising crime and violence would take time, and they knew the NYPD could not do it alone. At that time, starting to reclaim our neighborhoods required coordinated efforts along with ultimately the full and willing partnership of the people we serve. And where it took us two decades later was categorically historic, the lowest crime in three generations. The last three years in a row, 2017, 18, and 19, saw fewer than 800 shooting incidents in a city approaching 9 million people. Prior to that, in the modern era, the number of shootings in New York City never fell below 1,000. And although shootings rose by 22 incidents in 2019, showing that there is still work to be done, they were still down by 332 incidents, or 30 percent from just six years prior. Make no mistake, the past six years were a time of generally declining crime, with a nearly 15 percent reduction in all index crimes, led by a 30 percent drop in robbery, a 30 percent decline in burglary. In those six years, arrests were also down nearly 50 percent, and criminal summonses were down nearly 80 percent. We have clearly managed to keep crime falling steadily 
while dramatically reducing the enforcement footprint of this city. And New York has easily sustained its ranking as the city with the lowest overall index crime rate among the 20 largest cities in America. As we made our way through the last year and with crime in New York City reduced significantly compared to decades ago, a large number of people, I would say, adopted the view that crime, with crime down, there was no need for our law enforcement activity. And that viewprint now is significantly hampering our ability to keep people safe. We are currently facing assaults on much of the technology we use to home in on the real drivers of crime and violence in New York City, and this speaks to the precision policing. Tools that we use, we would argue, professionally, fairly, and constitutionally to find justice for victims by focusing with great precision on the serious crimes and the serious offenders who make up a relatively small percentage of the population. For one, Facial recognition is a hugely valuable tool in countering robberies, hate crimes, sexual assaults, shootings, and other violence on our streets. Given the scale of both city-owned and privately-owned security cameras, the images of these perpetrators are frequently captured on video. Our ability to compare these images to legally acquired mugshots of perpetrators from past crimes has taken our investigations to a new, greater level. Any facial recognition match is vetted by trained investigators with the, within the NYPD's facial ID section before it is forwarded to an investigating detective under Chief Rodney Harrison. And a facial recognition match by itself is not grounds to arrest a person or authorize a search warrant. It is a lead. A detective following that lead must establish with other corroborating evidence that the subject of the investigation is, in fact, the perpetrator. Let me emphasize, the NYPD does not misuse this technology. We agree that balance is necessary. We do not use it to identify participants in political protests. We do not surveil passerby in the general population. We do not even use facial recognition to identify people wanted on warrants. We use it to match images of people shown on video committing crimes to images of people in mugshot databases who have committed past crimes. As is the case of facial recognition, the NYPD has been charged with misusing the local, local DNA database. The database, which is managed and maintained by the city's office of the chief medical examiner, is used only to compare suspect DNA to crime scene DNA, and DNA from one crime scene to DNA from other crime scenes, in order to match or exclude suspects in cases for which crime scene DNA is available. The DNA profiles in this database are untouched except when a match is found between crime scene evidence from a rape case, for example, and a suspect. DNA objectively distinguishes unique individual identities. Unless their DNA is matched to crime scene DNA in a given case, people whose DNA samples are included in the database are at no risk of being subject to law enforcement inquiry. And let me be clear. The NYPD knows of no person who has ever been falsely convicted, indicted, or even arrested because of evidence from the New York City DNA database. On the other hand, prospective suspects in rapes, murders, and other crimes have been routinely excluded from investigations on the basis of DNA, sparing them police inquiries and possible interrogations. Although critics have suggested that the NYPD is routinely collecting huge volumes of DNA examples, like samples, excuse me, from arrestees, the database currently contains about 30,000 suspect DNA exemplars, compared with nearly 1.8 million arrests in the past six years. Most of the samples have been taken from suspects during active investigations of serious crimes, and in response to concerns about the duration of time samples are maintained in the database, the NYPD will begin auditing the database and recommending that the OCME remove exemplars that are no longer needed in active investigations. Again, balance. As for the NYPD's criminal group database, referred to by some as the gang database, we maintain a collection of about 550 street crime gangs and crews. I can tell you with certainty that 91% of the database entries have been arrested for at least one serious felony. Across the list, entrants averaged 12 arrests, including an average of 5.7 felony arrests. They have been linked to more than 700 murders in New York City and 20,000 robberies. 
So let me repeat that. 20,000 cases of stealing something from another using force, and more than 700 lives ended. It would be grossly irresponsible for the NYPD to fail to monitor these groups, who were among the principal purveyors of violent crime in New York City. The entry process to the database is closely controlled. Most police officers are not authorized to recommend new entries. Only field intelligence officers who track criminal activity in each precinct and other gang experts may make these recommendations. And based on their detailed knowledge of on-the-ground situations, they submit supporting documentation, which is reviewed by supervisors with gang expertise. The oversight structure that ensures that multiple gang experts agree on every database entry. Further, the NYPD systematically culls the database to remove the names of people who have, quote, aged out of gang activity or had no negative contacts with the police in three years. There are now approximately 18,300 names in the criminal group database. That is compared to over 35,000 in 2014. Only 2.7% 2 are currently under the age of 18. The average age of all entries is 27 years of age. Importantly, no, no NYCHA official, landlord, or prospective employer has access to any name in the database. Federal immigration agents are likewise locked out. And critics cannot cite a, simple, a single instance of anyone being denied housing or a job or being subject to immigration enforcement on the basis of the NYPD gang database, mere entry into which has never been grounds for arrest or any other type of enforcement action. In my opinion, an entrenched street gang spreading violence and fear through a community is just about the worst thing that could happen to a neighborhood. Do we really want our police to begin at square one each time there is an act of gang violence? Surely it is better than that professional investigators already know the likely perpetrators of a gang shooting, perpetrators who, have met, who themselves are now at grave risk of retaliation from an opposing group. This is what our investigators see each day. Knowledge of members is essential to any effort to intercede with gang culture, but also to pu pull young men out of criminal life before they are arrested or killed. As I hope I have made clear, these investigative resources are centrally important to the NYPD's ongoing enforcement efforts. As used by the NYPD, they do not re represent a threat to civil liberties. They do, however, represent a marked advance from many of the older methods of investigating crime, such as eyewitness IDs and fingerprints. I trust we can agree to preserve these essential modern-day police techniques when used appropriately so that the hardworking members of the NYPD can continue to preserve public safety throughout New York City. So far in 2020, we are seeing increases in crime across multiple categories, which unfortunately reinforces what we already knew. I am on record as saying that I believe these increases are tied to some of the recent reforms that took effect in January. And we are already showing signs of cause and effect in the fall of 2019. We saw a momentum building in January, and now we are through February and into the first three days of March. And I will tell you that the second complete month of data sharpens our focus on what our response as a police department must be to keep New Yorkers safe. We are identifying precincts with the most dramatic increases in crime. We will use both traditional redeployment of personnel coupled with non-traditional redeployment. We will allocate additional overtime for these necessary steps as well. And let me be clear, we will do everything responsible, as we always do, to redeploy as necessary and keep New Yorkers safe. We recognize the challenges we are facing and we are addressing them. Our enhanced technological capabilities are some of the reasons that is possible. They have helped us to better focus our enforcement efforts on the real drivers of serious crime. Indeed, to a large extent, precision policing depends on our ability to effectively leverage technology, specifically in the areas of robbery, burglary, auto theft, and I would argue sexual crimes as well. We call these pattern crimes because they are frequently committed by chronic recidivists who often use identifiable methods that link suspects to several or more offenses in the same group. I would urge members of the council to maintain a sense of proportion about the technological resources the NYPD uses to fight both pattern crimes and shootings, the most prominent, prominent of which tools I mentioned earlier, facial recognition, 
local DNA database, and the gang database. Each has brought greater precision, accuracy, and efficiency to our investigations of serious crime. I can tell you that in any time of rising crime, the last thing a police department needs is to have tools that we use to conduct such investigations removed. Simply put, the police needs tools to do our jobs. We need tools to effectively and efficiently keep people safe, and that goes for all aspects of our work. The uniformed men and women on patrol answering calls for service, the seasoned detectives knocking on doors and tra tracking down every possible lead, and the investigators and analysts that work behind the scenes to pinpoint patterns and predict retaliatory violence. I'll say it again, and I'll be emphatic. Investigative resources are centrally important to all of our NYPD's enforcement efforts and ultimately to our effectiveness. Turning to budgetary issues, the NYPD plans to again apply for and to obtain federal assistance to protect members of the public and critical infrastructure, including the financial district, the transit system, bridges, tunnels, and ports. On February 14, 2020, FEMA announced the federal fiscal year 2020 notice of funding opportunities for the Homeland Security grants to assist states, urban areas, and others with their preparedness efforts. The NYPD has already begun the process of preparing the applications, which are due on April 15th. It is anticipated that these grants will be awarded no later than September 30th of this year. Historically, the federal Homeland Security funds have brought us a lot including our bomb squad's total containment vessel, the rolling vault that allowed the NYPD to remove the live pressure cooker bomb planted on a street in Chelsea, and some 16 pipe bombs mailed to various recipients throughout New York and the country. The money also funds our vaporweight dogs that patrol large-scale events, searching for hidden explosives and keeping all New Yorkers safe, and our active shooter training that hones the tactical skills of thousands of officers who might one day have to face a machine gun wielding attacker in a crowded concert venue or school. These funds also allow the NYPD to hire intelligence research specialists, or IRS, deploy officers to the transit system and other strategic locations citywide based on intelligence, and to train officers to respond to chemical, ordnance, biological, and radiological threats of incidents. The NYPD uses federal funds to purchase personal protective equipment for uniform members and to purchase other critical equipment that enhances our ability to protect New Yorkers in vital transportation and port infrastructure. In addition, these funds have allowed us to develop and sustain our sensor and information technology centerpiece known as DAS, which supports the police department's counterterrorism mission. On February 10, 2020, the President's budget for federal fiscal year 2021 was released, which reflects significant decreases for state and local grants for first responders under the Federal Homeland Security Grant Preparedness Grants. The budget proposes a national funding level for Urban Area Security Initiative of only $426 million after being funded at $665 million in federal fiscal year 20, or a 36 percent reduction. The State Homeland Security Program proposes amount is $332 million, a reduction of 41 percent from the prior year. The Transit and Port Security Grant proposed amounts are reduced from $100 million to $36 million, or, 30, or 64 percent each. Although we undoubtedly are undoubtedly the safest of all large cities of comparable size in the country, we clearly re maintain, remain the nation's top terror target. New York City has been the target of approximately 30 terror plots since the devastating attacks of September 11, 2001. Plans that have included a would-be suicide bomber who detonated a homemade explosive device in a subway passage beneath Times Square, a fatal truck attack on pedestrians and bicyclists along the West Side Highway, plans to place bombs among festive crowds watching July 4th fireworks, and a plot to capture on video the beheading of a woman in Manhattan. While we must be at the top of our game every single minute of every single day, we are acutely aware that those who wish us harm need only to be successful once. Regarding the preliminary budget and its impact on the NYPD, the NYPD's fiscal year 2021 city tax levy expense budget is $5.3 billion. The vast majority of this, 92%, is allocated for personnel costs. As part of the November 
19 financial plan, the NYPD received additional funds for 250 civilian personnel and techno techn technology upgrades to allow the police department to better comply with recent changes in the criminal justice reform laws. Complying with these laws requires an enormous amount of new funding, none of it from the state, plus a massive retooling of NYPD practices, several important technological upgrades, and the hiring of hundreds of additional personnel across several areas of the department. These new funds will help pay for such things as new portals to better share information with district attorneys, and the hiring of criminalists and others to more quickly produce case materials and handle the increased paperwork burden. The expense funding totaled $24.7 million in fiscal year 2020 and $20.7 million in fiscal year 2021 and the out years. This is in addition to capital funding provided during the adopted capital commitment plan. The NYPD re received $28 million for crime lab technology upgrades and $10 million for legal technology to better allow for compliance with the discovery law changes. The NYPD's preliminary capital budget contains $1.64 billion for fiscal years 2020 through 2024. Aside from the funding provided in October, the department received additional funds for the following. 137 Center Street renovation for special victims, $18.6 million for building improvements to this space, which currently houses the Manhattan Special Victims Squad and will include additional units to minimize the department's lease footprint. Argus camera expansion of 3.6 million to install additional cameras in areas that might be the scene of hate crimes. And the 116th Precinct Station House in Queens, an additional 17.2 million was provided for the increased costs of construction based on the most recent bids. Construction for this facility is projected to begin in the spring of 2020. And finishing up, across the NYPD, we will continue to leverage every tool available to us to keep New York City safe, including the, the use of new and innovative technology. We are keenly focused on such advances and how they can be applied to fighting crime, creating safer and more efficient ways for police officers to do their jobs, and also contributing to the important work of building trust and strengthening relationships throughout the five boroughs. As we take neighborhood policing to the next level, by way of our invigorated youth strategy and through all of the remarkable changes we are undertaking in the NYPD. We have the mayor's full support and have benefited greatly from the city council's support as well. I thank you for your ongoing partnership and for everything you do to help build a more effective and efficient NYPD, always with officer safety in mind. New York needs even more of our ideas and all of our actions now. And that goes for the entire public safety spectrum, from, from traditional crime to terrorism, and to the seedbed activities that can draw young people down paths of criminality. This is our mission, and we owe every New Yorker nothing but our best efforts. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify this afternoon, and I'm happy now to take your questions. Thank you, Commissioner Shea, and we're joined by Council Members Gibson, Brannon, Powers, Cohen, Miller, and Vallone. Uh, and first, I'll start off with new needs uh, for this fiscal year. First off, are there any new needs that you've requested from the administration that have not been funded? We're continuing to work with OMB to look at what exactly will look like. There are various items that we are focused on, some OTPS needs and um, some PS needs, but we're still trying to work out exactly what we'll get. And has the administration given you a savings target uh, to reach before the budget is adopted? We are also talking to OMB about where we can find efficiencies, but we don't have a specific number that we've landed on with them yet. And when will you have those specifics? Uh, at the time of the executive budget. Okay. Um, can you talk about capital? Are there any additional capital needs that you have that have not been funded yet? Uh, at this point, we uh, have addressed, as the commissioner said, some of the significant needs we had, for example, in the 116th precinct. Uh, the money for, for the bids. We are evaluating the cost for some of our other programs, uh, so there may be additional needs at exec, but we're still evaluating that. And I'm happy that we're building a new precinct in South Queens. Uh, no complaints about more money being added. Um, so you're anticipating more money being added? We, we're evaluating it as, okay. as, as with that example, when bids come okay. in, we have to make adjustments. 
Are there any federal funding cuts you anticipate? And I know you touched on it a little bit, Commissioner, and I thought I heard of reports that the Trump administration certainly was reassessing um, grants that he was giving to New York City based on us being a sanctuary city. So we're not anticipating any cuts there? We are hopeful that in working with the federal government, we'll be able to maintain the level of funding that we have had in the past. So you're pretty confident? We're, we're hopeful. And if they did decide to cut, uh, where would we find the monies? Do you believe you'll be able to fill those gaps? We would work with OMB to prioritize what are critical needs in those areas. And the total uh, on those grants again are? Uh, the total for federal funding, uh, the fiscal year, federal fiscal year 19 for federal funding was 142. Over the last five years, we've received a total of $900 million in federal okay. funding. Let's hop into criminal justice reforms quick. As a result of state criminal justice reforms, the NYPD must now expedite the exchange of documents and evidence to 15 days after arraignment. That includes providing information such as 911 calls, body camera recordings, warrants, and other evidence uh, to prosecutors. As a result, the NYPD budget NYPD's budgets added over 20 million per year to hire 250 new positions. Uh, where are we at in hiring for the new 250 positions? As of right now, we have 163 of those 250 on board. At uh, the um, end of next week, we'll have additional 59 starting. So at that point, we will have about 28 vacancies remaining. So we'll be about 90% of the way there. Okay, and can you tell us the need for specific titles? For example, why the need for 82 police communication technicians uh, and 20 police administrative aides in the highway division? So the uh, police administrative aides are uh, necessary to help with collecting all of the information that needs to be turned over, and there's a significant amount of work that needs to be done in that area. With the PCTs, you also need individuals to be able to review and evaluate uh, the 911 information that is coming in. Let's hop over to um, headcount questions, civilianization. Um, and we have a graph pretty much here. In the most recent analysis we've had regarding your uniform members performing civilian duties, there were 368 potential uh, civilianizable positions. Do you have any plans to civilianize these positions and get the right person working on the job? We Why are, are police officers doing those jobs? Yes, we are having ongoing conversations with OMB about further civilianization. And can you tell me what those conversations are? How many uh, positions do we anticipate? We are still in the discussion phase, but it is around the, the 360 area that we've discussed in the past. All right, and we saw 30 of these positions are management auditors. What, what do they do? How are uniform officers performing this job? I'm gonna have to get back to you on that. So nobody knows what management auditors are? Anyone here from person? Anyone here from personnel, but management auditor is not a position that I'm familiar with. Okay, so you'll follow back up with us on that. Let me hop to text to 911, and this is one of the reasons I think this conversation is critical because we in, do anticipate, obviously, there'll be an uptick in 911 calls, especially with text to 911. Um, when do we anticipate text to 911 to go live? Because every month we hear a different story on this. Let me. Tony, Tony will come up from uh, ITV, and I can tell you, Councilman, that we are already seeing an increase in volume of radio runs uh, at the beginning of this year. Right, and that's prior to text. Correct. Okay. Thank you, Good afternoon. Uh, Deputy Chief Anthony Tasso, Commanding Officer of the Information Technology Bureau. So we've been working very closely with Do It on a, a June release for um, text to, to 911. Um, our communications division and our life safety division have worked very closely hand in hand with uh, throughout the whole process. They're currently assisting them with testing. Um, we've taken some other steps. Uh, we've created a media unit, a multimedia unit, to process any multimedia attachments that might come uh, in with those text uh, 911 calls. Um, we've also done some application development work to make sure that the text to 911 indicators are present for the police officers so they know that the 911 call came in through text. Right, and I'm assuming that our 911 operators are going to they are. Um, 
be much more overwhelmed over text to 911. What are we right. are we discussing? Any increases to to headcount in that specific area? Um, and this is why the the conversation around civilianization is so critical. I think during this juncture. So where where are we at with that? And we don't want our 911 operators being overwhelmed, being told to do more with less. Uh, and I think one way to resolve that is to see an increase in headcount there. Right. Um, they're all going through training. They, they've all been scheduled for training. So by the time we go live, um, we'll have a good contingent of all of our uh, dispatchers and call takers trained. And uh, I guess we'll assess moving forward uh, what the volume of calls are that are coming in and whether that necessitates. Uh, but as the commissioner just raised, he just spoke of already seeing an increase in radio runs. So with text to 911, we have to anticipate we're going to see uh, much more calls or texts coming in, obviously, which adds to the burden. And I've still not heard a specific plan on uh, where we're going to increase headcount there. Yeah, we, we evaluate that continuously on an ongoing basis, and we will adjust up if needed um, where we are seeing the, the results of that increase in radio runs. We are able to absorb it at the PCT level. Uh, we have not had a need to add additional staff. Where we are feeling it more is on the patrol side uh, and responding to those calls. All right. To be continued, but I don't think we should fall behind the eight ball here. I don't want to stay here forever, but we've had this conversation every year. And, and being that the conversation around bill reform and all of these things are happening and people are pointing to bill reform, uh, I think this is an opportunity to ensure uh, that more civilians are doing the job that you have cops who can be out on the streets patrolling doing. So this is why this conversation is so critical if you're speaking of seeing increases. I, I agree with you. Okay. I don't want an agreement, though. We want to see numbers. Um, coronavirus, as you know, a couple of coronavirus cases have been confirmed in New York. Can you tell us about the NYPD's planning for coronavirus? Do you have to, to do you have implementation plans for it? it? If a significant percentage of officers have to stay home. Currently, right now, we're meeting every day over at the OEM, three hour day meetings in the planning of where we are. Right now, we've issued masks, gloves, and uh, disinfectants to all of our precinct commands. We do not have them out on the street right now. There isn't a need for our cops to be going out wearing a mask to cause a panic at this point. But they are available in case it starts to become more prevalent. We have procedures in effect that if a call comes over of uh, an individual who's possibly suffering from coronavirus, that our officers will respond and remain outside the location awaiting EMS. EMS then, working with the fire department, will suit up in proper protection gear, and they will go in and remove that individual to whatever location that they need to go. If it were to progress, we're working hand in hand with OEM and every other city agency to determine what protocols we need to put in place. Currently, if an officer, we've had a few officers that have traveled to regions of the world that are uh, considered problematic. Upon their return, they've been told to self-isolate and stayed out of work for the 14-day period to see if uh, any of them become symptomatic. As of this point, no police officer is symptomatic. We currently have five that are right now uh, self-isolating. And are all patrol officers being given training, or what is? We've sent out messages uh, on what to do uh, on a daily basis. They've come from the police commissioner's office. They've come from my office. Right now, the information is what I stated, is how to respond to a potential case and to use basic flu protections. Consistently wash your hands, use disinfectants. Uh, and use the same sort of situation you do if there was a flu epidemic. All right, let's go into overtime. Thank you for that. And overtime. Overtime spending has been a persistent area of concern for the council. Uh, and we'll go to that slide. 
Uh, the budget for overtime for fiscal year 2020 and fiscal year 2020 averages 612 million, um, 531 million for uniform and 81 million for civilian. The slideshows actually show uh, overtime spending for the last four fiscal years. In blue is the city funded budget and red is state and federal grants that fund the NYPD's overtime and the green is the overage in spending. Uh, how much does the department receive in state and federal dollars for overtime spending? So the, uh, the non-city funding for the overtime budget in fiscal year 20 is um, right now about um, $79 million, but that will vary throughout, throughout the year. But that is the budget at this point. $79 million. Right. And, uh, uh, and, okay. and that's not federal. It's federal, state. So federal, state, federal. okay. And do you, and I talked about this, the, the anticipation of reductions in the grant, and you don't foresee that happening, We're right? hopeful we'll be able to maintain the same levels, and the grant funding gets added throughout the year, so it's not fully reflected in the budget at this time. And what is the city-funded budget for overtime in fiscal 2020? Uh, the, the total for civilian and, and non-civilian and, and uniform is $546 million and the uniform city funded overtime cap is 506 million. 506 million, so we, we went over. We anticipate we're gonna go over. Well, at, at this point, uh, as we have done in the last four fiscal years since the inception of the uniform overtime cap, we have essentially lived within the cap. We are monitoring this closely. Obviously, there are a lot of different events that happen over the course of the year. So at this point, uh, we are focused on the cap and continuing to, to monitor, but uh, we uh, will know in the coming months exactly. And you can't describe the overtime control plan. Well, what's your overtime control the, plan? The overtime control plan is essentially at the beginning of the year, we look at the overtime allocation, we divide it amongst the bureaus, uh, and we monitor this constantly. Uh, every few weeks, uh, we're looking at reports, we're focusing on where overtime is up, and, and looking at particularly areas where there may be, no, may be discretionary overtime that we can adjust. And in 2019, the city-funded budget was exceeded by 22 million. Um, in a report given to the council, recent overages and spending were due to the transit priority post, post program and the transit homeless diversion program. Uh, why are these programs run on overtime? The, uh, the homeless, uh, the transit homeless and the priority posts are in part because we uh, were doing that on a temporary basis for the homeless, for example. It was focused on the coldest months of the year, so it made more sense from an efficiency perspective to utilize overtime for that. Okay, all right, I'm gonna start to wrap up, but I have a few more questions, and I wanna get uh, quickly into crime stats in general. Uh, murders and shootings, the major performance indicators used to assess a police department's performance is crime statistics. So let's talk about those for a moment. Uh, murders increased to over 300 in 2019, the largest figures in three years. Some of these, I understand, were actually from 2018 and were cases that were reclassified as murders. Can you tell us what changed about the accounting in these cases? Um, because we need to be clear, careful not to reclassify crimes as something else because it can distort the data we look at. So can you just tell us a little bit more? I mean, Mike Patry, our Chief of Crime Control Strategies, can go as deep as you want into the numbers. To, the short answer to your question is nothing changed. We have a system in place that has been in place, the same system for years, and that's the most important thing, continuity, in terms of reclassifying crimes. But it, it's predicated by on January roughly 15th of each year, the book closes and we report up the chain at what winds up going to the FBI. And, and then you run into situations where year after year, we do in fact have reclassified homicides, but it is the same defined standards used year after year, and that's out of our control. Just to add on that, uh, so, so two, two of the uh, easiest factors to describe is some uh, waiting on a official death certificate from the OCME, or somebody sustained uh, a, a injury, whether it be a gunshot or a stab wound, that then subsequently dies, in 2019, that would count as a 2019 murder. Okay. 
Uh, shootings also increased in 2019 and in January of 2020, there were 15 more shooting incidents in, than in January. Um, what is the department's strategy in countering this trend? So we're we, real time, we, we monitor this real time and we, we, we did see an uptick last year, uh, specifically in uh, two patrol boroughs, patrol borough Manhattan North and Manhattan South for, for the island of Manhattan, so an increase of 34 shootings. As far as precinct specific, uh, the 75 precinct in East New York saw an increase of 20 shooting incidents last year. Uh, we moved resources to, to an area of Manhattan North, the 23, the 25, the 28 across Central Harlem. We identified four developments that, uh, in and around those four developments, there was uh, crew-related violence. We we added numerous resources, both investigative and patrol. With patrol resources, we added foot patrol uh, offices in uh, in vehicles, and we also identified these crews and arrested uh, individuals for, uh, for you know for, for the related crimes. As far as um, what we're doing now, we are, uh, we are rolling out and all out. We're, we are going to be moving 300 administrative offices to areas in the, in, across the city where we see, uh, where we have dense uh, street crimes. When we look at the street crimes, we're talking about street robberies, grand larcenies from a person, and shootings. We're looking at historical data along with real-time 56-day data, and we've identified uh, 16 geographic areas in 16 precincts that these resources will be uh, added to, uh, both on the patrol side and the investigative side. Uh, the commissioner uh, spoke briefly about the, the youth forum. We had our youth, our first youth forum uh, last month, and that was specific to the island of Manhattan, where we see the largest increase of youth-related uh, robberies, but also, also the largest increase of youth victims. And we actually will be having a follow-up this Friday with probation to talk about uh, the drivers of those youth robberies in Manhattan. And can you go through domestic violence shootings? Sure. Uh, domestic violence continues to drive uh, UCI crime uh, in New York City. And when you drill down on it and you look at uh, the housing developments across the city, quite frankly, it's alarming. Uh, you know, we have a- What's the percentage you would say? The, the percentage of domestic violence UCI crime is, is close to 40% in uh, New York City housing developments. That's not, just let me jump in, uh, that's not an increase of 40%? That that's correct. Domestic violence crime makes up 40%, 40 of percent. And, and that- Of the shootings you're saying? No, 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 of them. all seven, of all seven majors. All seven all majors, seven so majors. DV is the large driver of that. That's correct, and that uh, unfortunately has been consistent. Uh, we have a robust uh, domestic violence, uh, I think the, the best in, in, in the country, where we are aggressively, proactively uh, looking at uh, domestic violence indicators, not only at the precinct level, at the borough level, and also there is a domestic violence unit that reports directly to the chief of department. I get to the, we have domestic violence uh, counselors in every precinct. Uh, we have domestic violence officers in every precinct. So this, this re remains a focus um, because we know the danger that could come out of it. But it seems like we need to do a lot more work perhaps with organizations on the ground and perhaps more coordination. And I know you, you've taken some good yeah. steps in that direction, but maybe strengthening that um, could help in this area. We have advocates in every precinct. Uh, we work very closely uh, with uh, domestic violence shelters, uh, uh, Safe Horizon. We work very closely with our district attorney's office. Uh, there's, this is a robust multi-agency uh, plan to, to uh, decrease domestic violence. Let me get into clearance rates quickly. So the clearance rates in 2019 for burglary were 35%. Um, for larceny theft, it was 23%. And for vehicle theft, it was 18%. Um, so we've been having a lot of conversations around bail reform, and I know we don't see eye to eye, obviously, on this issue. Um, is it possible that this explains the uptick in crime in certain categories that are now being blamed on bail reform? How do you explain 35% larceny thefts, 23%, and vehicle theft, 18% yeah. clearance rates? Is I that mean, the reason? I look, at, I look at the clear, I'm not sure. I understand the question. When you look at the clearance rates on how we take reports in New York City, how many get closed by arrest, how many cases get referred to 
the Detective Bureau, how many of those get closed by arrest. I see consistencies year after year after year. I don't see anything jumping off this year, whether you're talking low-level crimes or whether you're talking shootings or homicides. And you would say 35% clearance rate on burglaries is normal per fiscal year? I, I, I look at the clearance rates that we see across the city and I see consistency. Um, so citywide crime clearance rate. Remember there's a difference too with the clearance rates in terms of there's many times that we identify who does that crime, but they will not for a variety of reasons be charged. Mr. Chair, if I could just uh, take over real quickly. Uh, if you just look um, throughout each borough, uh, if you want to talk about burglaries, uh, a clearance rate is uh, in the Bronx, 35% in Brooklyn, it's 33%. In Manhattan, it's going to be 49%. Queens, 27%. Uh, and Staten Island is 33%. That seems to be steady um, throughout the comparison to 2018. It's the numbers I'm reading off to you right now are from 2019. And it's somewhat synonymous with the numbers from, from 2018. Well, it seems like great work is being done in Manhattan. Uh, what about the outer boroughs? You have, to, you have to peel back the individual crimes and there are differences. So for example, in Manhattan, what you will see is stores that are constantly hit by groups shoplifting or people that are, have a drug habit and go into a particular store. I mean, Mike could tell you and Rodney could tell you time after time whether it's certain drug stores continuously get hit. And then what will happen is the people that get caught stealing will sign an affidavit that they will not go back to these stores and then what you have is when they do it again they are charged with burglary so there is even when you see the simple word burglary they mean very different things potentially in different boroughs when you see lower rates on solved burglaries that's the traditional climb through the window you come home from work and now your apartment is ransacked um, sometimes you also see package theft, depending on where the package is, fall into this. So you really need to dig down into the numbers. And if you want to talk about caseload, I know there was a concern about Manhattan, but the caseload for um, all the boroughs, uh, Manhattan South caseload per detective is 247, uh, Manhattan North is 222, uh, the Bronx is 192, Brooklyn South is 200, Brooklyn North is 167, Queen South is 170, Queens North is 225, and Staten Island is 140. So um, throughout the city, the average caseload per detective in the number squads is going to be 196, which is down from 2018, which is 207. So we're down 5% overall. But I'm sure uh, now that I mentioned these clearance rates across the borough, that's something you're going to look at a little bit closer? It would be hard to look at it closer because we look at it every single day. We really do. Every day we're looking at this. Mike LaPetri, this is what he wakes up, goes to bed, he dreams about it. He wakes up in the middle of the night and his wife says he's talking about clearance rates. <laughs> well, I once got an 18 on a test in high school. That wasn't too good. I'm not ashamed to say it because I graduated. But that was the ninth grade when I was goofing off. I don't know if this would even, this, this is really bad. I mean, so this is what people can be feeling actually on the streets when we, when we go out to, to different communities they're saying they feel um, some upticks in, in some of these areas and if our clearance rates are low and I'm not I mean we could go back and forth on it um, I would take umbrage with people. this is bad I, I, I would pivot to you have the best police department in the country and I think we should all be proud of it and if I, if I agree with you and this is why around Bill we should stop jumping out and talking about bill without conclusive numbers. If you take a look at clearance rates. Because <laughs> we do have the best NYPD in. If uh, you compare clearance rates department. of the NYPD to any other police agency in the country, we far exceed them. If you look at Chicago, especially on homicides, it's not even close. Shootings, they don't even come close to us. Again, you're taking a look at a grand larceny where someone may break into the car in the middle of the night and steal a wallet out of it. Those are not easy crimes. To, to solve. So that will end up as a case that's hard to, hard to close. But we do this better than anyone in the world. And if you take a look at who we arrest, and we arrest the same people over and over again, and as you talk about bail reform, a lot of these same people, once we arrest for multiple cases, are right back out and we have to rearrest them. Precision policing is all about less enforcement footprint, which we've demonstrated lowest era of arrests, stops, and summonses right now. 
and concentrating on people that are doing the most crime. But the converse is also true, so that when we do make those arrests that Terry mentions, it makes it difficult when they get released. And if I could just say one more last thing, then I'll pass it over to uh, Chief LePetri. Uh, neighborhood policing has helped us with a lot of clearance rates. Um, a lot of people are a lot more forthcoming to cooperate with us now because they know their, their local police officer, they, they know who their neighborhood coordination officer is, and there's a better trust factor that's helping us solve a lot of cases. All right, we'll be watching those clearance rates closely as we debate bail reform, and I know some of my other colleagues will certainly have a lot more to say on this. Um, the last question's on DNA, and obviously in the budget, we don't clearly see what the NYPD is doing with DNA. Uh, what we can see is a forensic investigative division, which has a budget of $53 million, 330 uniform officers, and 283 civilian personnel. Can you tell us what portion of this budget goes directly to DNA collection analysis and other DNA-focused work? The numbers you're reading off are, are tied to the lab uh, in total, so we'll have to get you uh, the, the um, investigations, uh, the lab work, so we'll have to get you a more granular breakout of how the, the budget breaks out, but that's right. the, the lab yeah. overall. And this division has a larger budget than the Grand Larceny Division, the Special Victims Division, et cetera. Even if all the money is not focused on DNA, how can you ensure that your DNA collection and analysis is not overstepping civil liberties when there are so many resources uh, made available? The, the lab, as, as is currently uh, positioned, is, is a mix of inside and outside. So, for example, uh, all of the crime scene units that go around New York City on the street responding every day and collecting the evidence that falls under the lab. As well as uh, the DNA, I would, we can certainly follow up and try to break out individual costs for you, um, but I would argue that that's a small portion of the overall work that the lab does. When you take a look at the, all the evidence that is collected and processed beyond DNA, um, when you look at the ballistic work, um, there, there are many, many different pieces to the lab outside of DNA. And uh, obviously we had a hearing there, 30,000 uh, people in the DNA local database. Uh, do you have numbers on a breakdown of uh, the ethnicities of those individuals? So I, I got it, Commissioner, sorry. So uh, Mr. Chair, um, we, we talked about a couple new policies that we're putting in place. Unfortunately, at that time, uh, on February 25th, when we had that hearing, we didn't have those, those numbers. Going forward- We have them now. No, no, we don't have the numbers now, but going forward, um, we're gonna use our PET system that's going to help identify the demographics of those individuals that are being put into this DNA local database. And at that 25th uh, hearing, uh, I believe you, uh, um, uh, uh, Chief of Detectives stated uh, you would be putting the process for DNA database removal on, on your website, including terms of obtaining a court order and a review process to date, and that has not been done. Wouldn't can we expect to see that on your website? It, it's it's going to be done um, within within a very very near future. There's a couple of things that we're re that we're adjusting regarding the entry and as well as the removal for DNA. Uh, we looked at the juvenile process. We looked at the consent form. We looked at uh, transparency, making people uh, cognizant about how to get themselves uh, out of this database. So we've, we're doing a lot of different things to uh, better the system to make sure it's done appropriately. And Commissioner Shea, do you believe innocent people who've not been convicted of anything should be in this database? I think we've demonstrated uh, through our efforts and the collaborative effort that we've done recently with the OCME and, and the different district attorneys, our willingness to listen. Um, anytime we collect someone's DNA in that, it's regarding a specific verified crime, uh, and we're coming up to be more transparent in terms of the policy that's going to be uh, released. We're also doing a uh, facial recognition policy, by the way, that is also going to be released, so that's two of the three. Um, and, and there are clearly stated policy, um, parameters when you see that policy in terms of not changing our policies, changing the, the collection form, reducing the number of times, which is already extremely small. When juveniles' DNA is collected, it is extremely small, even further reducing that. 
Um, so I'm comfortable where that policy is right now. And, and if I could just jump in, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman, sorry to cut you off, sir. We're looking within the next year or so to possibly remove close to seven to 8,000 individuals from the DNA, base, DNA database due to the fact that there's new stipulations that we're putting in place. And will that include, uh, I mean, I, well, I hear a year away, uh, will that include, and I think at the last hearing I requested, and Mr. Commissioner, I want you to answer this, uh, the Howard Beach case specifically, and I know you can't get into specifics because there's an appeal going on there, but there were over there were about 360 black men uh, whose DNA were obtained and put into that database, and, and obviously the NYPD uh, built the case against someone. Uh, are those individuals' DNA still in that database, and how soon can we get their DNA removed, being that they weren't convicted of anything. Yeah, well, I don't have that number that you had, and I definitely don't have uh, the racial breakdown that you have, um, so I'm not sure where you got that from. But what I can say about that case is um, it is ongoing. So in terms of the details of the criminal case and the collection of evidence, I won't comment on that. Um, but I, as, as I said a moment ago, we, we have, in an effort of transparency and working collaboratively with the different district attorneys, um, working with the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. We have come up with a, uh, a new policy that we think is fair and will be a, a step forward in terms of, uh, you know, fairer justice and, and utilizing these collection methods in New York City. Well, I believe 99% of those individuals are black men, um, and I'm hoping that they can at least get an apology, and secondly, their DNA be removed immediately uh, since they were not convicted of anything. Um, so that needs to be done yesterday, and we look forward to hearing a lot more conversation, less conversation actually around um, these men's, gentlemen's DNA being taken out of that system. Um, I will now turn it over to my colleagues. I mean, I have a lot more questions, but in lieu of time, we will certainly go to my colleagues for questions. So. We'll start with Councilmember Lanceman, and we're going to put a clock on for five minutes um, for colleagues. And if there's more time, we'll come around for a second round. So we'll start with Councilmember Lanceman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Commissioner, and to your team. Good afternoon. Daily News, March 3rd. Murders up 20% in year to year comparison. It's March 3rd, 2015. At the time, we were told, well, you know, in the course of the long 20-year decrease that started in the last two years of the Dinkins administration, a decrease in crime, there will be some months, some weeks, maybe even a year or two, where crime edges up. But the department will get its Let me start. hands on the situation and keep that crime number going down. So I was very surprised and my colleague and I were very surprised, and that's why we wrote you a letter, when after a one-month crime spike in January from 2020 over 2019, you declared bail reform to be the culprit. And we sent you a letter. We sent you a letter which highlighted the fact that of the um, Index crimes, January 20 versus January 2019, there was an increase, according to NYPD's own data released on February 4th, of 1,222 more crimes this year than last year, a 17% increase. And then when a political reporter asked you to break those down and tell us, well, how many of those crimes were, uh, how many of those crimes would have been people who uh, were now no longer eligible for bail under the new law. It turns out it's only about 84 out of those 1,222, or 7% of the January increase could conceivably, possibly, be attributable to people who had uh, been let out who otherwise might have been sitting on Rikers Island because they couldn't afford bail. Can we today, at this hearing, put to rest your assertion that the bail reform law that took effect on January 1st is in any way responsible for the nearly 17% increase in index crimes in January, when your own numbers show that at most 
7% of those crimes could possibly be attributable to bail reform. Respectfully, um, I, I disagree nearly with um, most of the assertions that you just recounted. I'll, I'll let Mike dig into the numbers. Those numbers are fluid, but uh, I do stand behind my comments. Um, we have, I've been doing this a long time. One thing I do know is crime in New York City, and we have never seen a month like January of 2020. It was the breadth of what we saw. It was almost universally all crime categories. It was double-digit crime increases. It was the largest crime increase going back, I stopped counting at 10 years in terms of one month in New York City. This is on the heels of a 20, almost a 20% decrease in the Rikers Island population in the preceding month. Not only do I disagree, I stand firmly behind my comments. And now it, we have- Is there anything- Now we in, have a second month Is in there anything row. in the math that I gave you because I, I, I think I, you're missing some of the details though. So crime takes time to play out as arrests are made. Councilman Richards mentioned clearance rates. As cases are solved, Mike will get into how those numbers are growing. And that's one aspect of what I knew at the time. That doesn't take into effect, for example, desk appearance tickets. That those are never making those numbers. Um, it doesn't take into effect what we're seeing in terms of, you have to remember that we've cut dramatically our footprint in how we police New York City. I've said it three times already today, well, and we're we've, proud we've, of it. We've been doing that for six years, though, Commissioner. That's right. and, and commissioners before you, Commissioner O'Neill, and certainly That's Commissioner right. Bratner, sat, Bratton sat in that chair, yep. and in various ways, shape, or form, and told us, if you enact this reform, crime is going to go up. And crime has not gone up. And now we have a one-month spike, one of many one-month spikes. We're into our third spike, month. One of many such spikes over the course of the 20-year the decline in crime. I agree with you, Councilman, in, in your statement about, and I've said it, it, it has come out of my lips many times that you better be real careful when you make statements about crime on short-term fluctuations, because you can expect fluctuations in crime. So in light of that... What we saw in January was not a fluctuation in crime. It was a categorical shift based on a couple of factors here. You have to understand the pipeline. We have never had a 20% drop in the New York City prison system in a 30-day period. That is seismic, and we, we should not be surprised by the results we got. 20% of, think of the last six years of precision policing. Rikers Island used to be 21,000 people. Do you, do you it have was any, down to seven, it, and then 20% was do you walked have any, out. Do you have any data on whether or not the individuals who committed these offenses were people who were released from Rikers Island in the month of December? Because relying just on bailable offenses, the numbers just don't add up. Good afternoon. So I do have empirical data. I also have analytical, analytical, anecdotal evidence that bail reform is part of the spike in crime, uh, namely the violent crime, your UCR seven majors in New York City. I can stay here all day long and go over the many factors that contribute to a criminology study. All right, this was done uh, scientifically with data scientists that work directly uh, in my office, it was shaped by myself, who I think I have many, many years of experience uh, shaping the, the data that I think we have the most accurate analysis. And I will keep this in the simplest terms, but it is very, very difficult to keep it in simple terms. And like the, com like the commissioner said, there are so many confounding variables that uh, affect bail reform. But the simplest term, what you're asking for, is the empirical data on non-bail eligible felonies, correct? So, so that's what we did. Sure. So we, look, we looked at non-bail eligible felonies. Um, and when we look at non-bail eligible felonies from January 1st 
of this year to February 28th of this year compared to the same period, apples to apples, in 2019, we see 482 people who have reoffended more than 800 times compared to uh, less than 600 times in 2019. What's very concerning is... So, sorry, just so I understand, 800 to 600. That is correct. What is very concerning... At a and, time and, when less arrests are being right, made. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drill down on this. What is uh, very concerning is within those 800 crimes, there are 35% 30, of those, or 299 have been seven majors, compared to 18% or 109. So that is that is a two point that that is an increase of three times two point seven. So that's about did you say two hundred ninety nine? Two hundred and ninety nine. Th those individuals mm -hmm. who were ROR'd on a non bail eligible felony in those in those two months. In those two months. Right. And how? Sorry. And that's arrests. I sorry. think the I think the councilman uh, hit on something before, which obviously. Uh, Chief Monahan discussed, uh, you know, our clearance rate, we're very proud of our clearance rate. Look, we want to be 100%. But these are people arrested. This is not people who we know are reoffending a lot more across the city of New York with 7,000 less arrests. And I'm just talking about this does not include our decline prosecutions, which are through the roof. And, and a lot of people say, well, why are your decline prosecutions through the roof? So I'm going to give you an example. One of those examples is a non-bail eligible seven major on burglary third degree and burglary second degree. Who are your patent burglars in New York City right now? Those are your patent burglars. They are not your burglary first degrees because a lot of these burglars are arrested after the fact because that's why we drop seven arrests on them at one time. So to become a burglary first degree, you have to have a weapon on you. You have to have an explosive on you at the time of that arrest. You have to cause a physical injury. That's not your patent burglar. Your patent burglar is the person that's going into somebody's dwelling, burglarizing it on a distinct modus operandi, going across the street using the same modus operandi to push through a to push through an air conditioner and to that person's dwelling. And that person could be home, doesn't affect the crime. They will then go down the block and commit the same burglary. So when we, uh, after investigations, we want it sooner, but sometimes later, we charge that person with seven burglaries. That person, because of bail reform, will not be charged with those seven burglaries. And here's why. Because that is an absolute non-bail eligible felony. So what does that do? That, all those crimes is modus operandi, which means the subject matter, all has to be met on the initial arrest, which means discovery has to be all turned over for seven burglary arrests. So now you're talking about DNA, you're talking about uh, photos, you're talking about interviews, you're talking about uh, tra 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 traceable property. So it is impossible to charge all those crimes. So what, what we are seeing for the two, two months of, of uh, looking at this bail reform empirically is that that person will only be charged with one of those burglaries. They will get ROR'd, and then the other six will be deferred for a later time so we can have everything in order to turn over the, the discovery. If not, that case will be declined, prosecution, declined prosecuted within 15 days. So again, these, these are anecdotal, anecdotal but also empirical things that need to be talked about. Let's look at arraignments. What I just described to you before on the increase of almost three times of the seven majors on non-bail eligible fines. And let's ask the victims if it matters to them because that's what they all are. And these are serious crimes. These are robbery third degrees. What's driving the robberies in the city of New York today? I'll tell you what's driving the robberies. Robberies aided by another by groups of males across the city. And what is that? That is a bail reform must release no bail. What's driving? Isn't that what Khalif Browder was arrested for? Robbery aided by another. I mean, I, not every not every robbery aided by another is a serious violent felony. I just want to understand that. The, the, I, would, I would disagree. You need to put yes, your mic. On. I, I, I mean, if you're if you're beating somebody up and taking their property and, and breaking their eye socket, that that's a robbery. 
and, and that's that's awfully damn. Yeah, but you don't but you don't need to do that level of violence for it to be robbery aided by another. But go ahead. I, I want to hear okay, your so whole. Okay, because I have more empirical data that I think is very very important. So again, we see an increase. We, we see an increase in non-bail eligible felonies only this year um, by almost three times, almost 200 more this year. What that data is showing, again, you have to be arrested after your initial offense. So if you committed that crime after your initial offense, it doesn't count. You could have done six burgs in, in December, but charged in February after initial, that was taken out but by, by the, uh, you know, by my analyst. The other thing is, this does not include decline prosecutions. When I just look at arraignment status, we are releasing people, 72% of individuals that are arraigned on a non-bail eligible felony this year are either ROR, DP'd, or DAT'd compared to 58% last year. That's 14%, and again, we're down 7,000 arrests. Let's drill down on it a little bit more. Let's look at our robbery and burglary non-bail eligible uh, felons. That then goes up to 16%, okay? Then when we look at um, the ages, driving 30%, 30% of our robbery arrests, again, arrests, are under the age of 18. With, with the change in law, as the NYPD has always stated, supported, but with the uh, things that we're seeing as far as who's making it into the youth part criminal court, who, who's getting adjusted with probation, and who's going to then Corp Council Family Court, you know, we have a, a lot of questions, and that is specifically what the police commissioner has asked me to do uh, during, you know, during the, the youth forum. And, the closer meeting that I'm having with probation on Friday is really getting to the adjustment period. You know, why are we seeing uh, youth under the age of 18 arrested four or five times after they were placed on probation? So we have questions, we have concerns. I have empirical data. I can speak to you, you know, anytime. I invite you up to my office and drill down even more. But I will say, law enforcement recidivism only grows during time. This is only two months of data. And these are re-arrests. This is only going to grow. This will only grow. Councilman, if, if Mike could just, because I know everyone wants to move on, but can you just mention, though, too, because I think it's helpful, the, the desk appearance tickets in a second. And before, as he gives you that information, which, again, is contributing to crime and is directly tied to the bail reform. But I, I want to say on the record again what I've said every time I've spoken about bail reform. We support the bail reform law. We... 100% support the bail reform law. You mentioned Khalif Browder. So whether it's somebody sitting in Rikers Island that can't make bail and somebody that does the same crime is getting out should be leveled. We 100% think that was right and just. Somebody sitting in Rikers Island being forced to take a plea because they can't see the evidence against them, 100% was the right thing to do, correct it. So we support the law. We think that the law, with minor changes to help public safety, can keep the spirit of the intention of the law. But if you could just mention the DAT. Yes, I, I would. Thank you, Commissioner. So, so on the, you know, across the state, the NYPD was was one of the only municipal police departments that that used the DAT procedure, and, and we used it for many reasons. And they were usually for low-level offenses, uh, for people that we felt were not a public safety risk. And uh, when, we, when we looked at the, the new procedure that was built into the criminal justice reform, we had uh, tons of concerns, and those concerns have just come to fruition. So let me just start it off with a very simple uh, analysis in that going back again to non-bail eligible uh, arrests, again, you cannot get bail from a judge. When we look at the percentage of DAT that are given this year compared to that last year, 12% or, or, eight, or 818 were given DATs, which means they walk right out of the precinct station house. And uh, in the past, the procedure was written, you cannot, be on, you cannot be on parole, you cannot be on probation, you know, stricter identification rules. That was all taken away from us. And now with those same bail eligible felonies compared to this year to last year, last year we, we gave 63. So 63 people qualified last year 
So they had to go, go to an arraignment where this year, 818 people walked out of precinct station houses. And the anecdotal evidence to that is, we arrest people on grand larceny of an auto, the stealing of a motor vehicle. They get a DAT just like somebody that, that walks into a department store and takes a shirt off the rack also gets a DAT. And we have anecdotal evidence that individuals that we arrest for grand larceny auto multiple times this year have walked out of a precinct station house on a DAT for a grand larceny auto, walked two blocks, jumped into a motor vehicle that was running, and stole that vehicle. So my time has expired. Um, I do want to say that the data that you cite with the fewer number of people who are getting, sitting in bail, sitting in Rikers Island, the fewer number of people who are getting DATs, the fewer number of people, those are all laudable goals. And for many of us, that represents the success of bail reform. And in order, in order for you to persuade me, and I think anybody else, that these reforms are causing the spike in crime, you're going to need much more than just anecdotal evidence. I gave you and empirical. I, I gave you empirical. You gave me some. And I could, I could if give I had, you much, much if more. I, if I had the time, we can go back and forth with them. I would be happy to sit with you I and would, go through this in, in detail. I, I welcome it. But the letter that the chairman and I sent to the commissioner, which we have not had a response to, um, lays out data and math. And nothing that you've said to me today refutes the data and the math of the felonies of the crimes that have been committed and who have been arrested for committing those crimes. I, I disagree with you wholeheartedly. I have the empirical data. I, I, I don't know if you were understanding what I was saying, but, but I disagree. I disagree. So, okay. But we welcome the, the sit down and, and the point about everything that you hold as good as do we. I think that, as you said earlier, um, council member, everything we do has to be balanced. Whether it's using technologies, respecting the rights of people and privacy issues, but keeping the public safe, and I would make the same argument here. Of course we want to get as many people as we can out of Rikers Island, sitting in prison upstate. Of course we want to do that. We've demonstrated the last six years as we have significantly worked with prosecutors, worked with nonprofits, worked with the council, rewritten our policies internally, rewritten laws. We've, we've knocked down, I mean, when you look at a 50% reduction in crime that's directly led to a reduction in Rikers, and then therefore, a reduction in state prison populations. That was all accomplished before the bail reform law. And we welcome other opportunities to do it. But very quick movements, such as I cited with a 20% drop, without safety nets in place, without options for judges. I, I think that when you look at some of the data that Mike has, when you look at some of the, the stories that you see in newspapers, et cetera, there's got to be a middle ground, and that's what I welcome. Thank you, and we're going to request you, you to say, that data. You've got to also think about the stories of the people who are not sitting in Rikers and are with their family. Those are stories, we, too. We, we agree. Yeah. Look, we agree with, with, you know, with that, but again, when we look at uh, the individuals that are getting out because of non-bail eligible felons. That, that is not those people. These people are convicted felons. These people are committing crimes all across the city. Again, I gave you arrest data. I did not give you what they're offending, okay. really. Okay, all right. We're gonna move on from this because I gotta get to my colleagues. Council members Rosenthal, followed by Rosenthal, Gibson, Deutsch, Brandon, Miller, Perkins. But we're requesting that data, by the way. Thank you so much, Chair, and thank you, Commissioner, and all your staff for being here. I want to preface my question by just making it clear that uh, I encourage all uh, victims of sexual assault to come forward to the NYPD Special Victims Division uh, in order to get justice. Um, I also encourage them to go to a crime victim treatment center, the Alliance Against Sexual Assault, in order to get their own personal healing together. So I really want to make sure that's very, very clear um, because I've been, a, you know, that's not what's been in the paper. And so I want to make it very clear that I encourage people 
uh, to come forward always. I'd like to ask and confirm a couple of the numbers, and um, this is data uh, that um, on the Special Victims Division that uh, a couple of years ago we passed legislation requiring this data be posted, and so I've looked at that data, and, and that's the source of my questions. So first of all, I see that um, the, just looking at the adult squad, which is what the DOI report was about. I see an increase in rape case load, in rape cases between 2018 and 19 of 288. That's what your data shows. So we have an increase in adult cases. Um, the case load, again, this is only looking at the adult squad, which is what the DOI report was about. The caseload came down very meaningfully. So prior to the um, report coming out, the caseload for the adult squad in some years was as high as 80 cases per detective, sometimes 70 per detective, and now it's in the low, low mid-50s. Right? So there's a meaningful drop in caseload. There's a real attention being paid. I would argue that 50 cases per detective is still far too high, and we're not doing enough. We're not giving them enough tools, right? We want to see that number come down even more, because I believe, and I, I hear this from the advocates, um, that 50 itself is, is still way too high. I want to look at the child caseload, the child squad caseload. So I'm looking at the numbers. You know, there are two columns, adult caseload and total child caseload. Um, so in 2019, the caseload was 308 cases per detective. Can you explain to me how any detective can rightfully investigate a case if their caseload is 308. Councilwoman, uh, good afternoon. We're Rodney Harrison, Chief of Detectives. So uh, let's, if you don't mind, I want to just real quickly talk, discuss the adult squad cases, and it's at 55 cases per per investigator, and I know you. No, I just really asked about the, the child the, the squad, child, child and the squad. reason I'm asking is because I'm concerned that the DOI report focused on adult cases where you have successfully brought down the caseload to a number that many advocates would argue is still way too high, but the child squad has suffered, has suffered. 300 cases per detective. So I'd like to understand how any detective can investigate child sexual abuse cases if they have 308 cases at any given time. That's my question. So uh, I, I don't have the um, cases for the child abuse squads? I can uh, tell but, you, but I, I, the can, number of cases opened in 2019 was roughly the same as the number opened by the adult squad. But roughly it's going to be but, between 5,800 and 6,400. Councilwoman. But the number of detectives is half. Councilwoman. So I can't I can guarantee understand. you, I can guarantee you that they are not holding 300 cases per it, I'm only reporting from I, your I will, have to, I will have to get back to you. From your that cannot public be accurate. website. And my last question, because I don't want to go back and forth on this, Chair, my last question has to do with the length of time and the training that you give to the Special Victims Division, which you now publish on your website. I added up the weeks, and it's three weeks four days and three hours. 
Remarkably, every single detective passed every single exam 100% in the first round, which is interesting to me. They're, wow. But I want to know, what's the length of training for somebody who is in the motorcycle squad? Is it more or less than three weeks? All right, so council, let me just go over some of the training that's being given to the Special Victims Division. Um, going into the March uh, 11th and 12th, we're going to um, make sure 50 of the investigators have the FETI training. Uh, that means now that 85 members of the service that are inside to Special Victims uh, will still be looking to get FETI trained. We're going to give another FETI training in June. And, you know, once again, we've had uh, intimate conversations about the numerous amount of training sure. that the special victim uh, investigators get. Um, they get the trauma-informed training, which is um, distributed and conducted by the mayor's office. Right. Uh, there are four hours of classroom instruction in trauma-informed interview training. This is all on your website. Yep. For the SVD training, they get five days, and there are... The examinations are administered at the beginning and upon completion of the course, evaluating the student's proficiency, 100% pass rate for the SVD training. So yes, you have five days for an SVD, you have four hours for the trauma-informed, and for FETI, you have seven days, and uh, it says the student's successful completion of the training delineates passing proficiently. So if I understand your question correctly, you have a concern about everybody passing the, the training? Is that, is that what you're inquiring? I have three concerns. Okay. One, that three weeks is not enough. And what I'm hearing from experts and what is the standard across the country is closer to 10 to 15 weeks. And secondly, I'm noticing that while the legislation asked for whether or not somebody success, you know, a report on whether or not someone successfully passed a class, that information is not given for over half of the classes. Over 80% of the classes are PowerPoints. So sitting in a room with a PowerPoint instruction. And I'm concerned that the FETI training with the high rate, and I really don't wanna get into it here, but the fact that you have 50 more detectives getting FETI training in the upcoming weeks mm -hmm. tells me that 50 left because the last time we met, you let me know that 100% of the detectives had FETI training. So I'm concerned that 50 have left since the last time we talked. I'm glad you got 50 more in. I'm glad they're getting FETI training. But that does raise a specter of concern as well. Right, and my time you. is up. Thank you. Okay. okay. Councilwoman, uh, first on the adult squads, thank you for recognizing that the the shift downward in the caseloads per investigator. Oh no, I don't want you to misunderstand what I've said uh, I, because I have had this experience with you misunderstanding my trying to be polite and gracious. The number of uh, cases per detective in the adult squad is woefully high, woefully high. It is at least two or three times higher than what it should be. So please do not mischaracterize my generous, kind statement with approval for where we are. I in no way, shape, or form am happy with where we are in the Special Victims Division. A decrease from 80 cases to 50 means a decrease from okay. horrible to bad. Okay, okay I'm going to let okay? you answer. And now with the child squad at 308 cases per detective, beyond even what the DOI report looked at for the adult squad is shameful. So please don't mischaracterize what I have said, Commissioner. The, to the uh, multiple points there, to the, to the child squad, 
I'll commit to Rodney can take a second look at that, and we are absolutely committed if there is a problem with the caseload, with the child investigations, we will move resources to correct it. Absolutely. Move from outside of the Special Victims Division or within the Special Victims Division? It would be from outside. If Let's it is be in, clear. If it is in, I, I am being clear. If it is, in fact, a problem. I will point out that not all of those cases involve, just for the room, not all of those cases involve sexual abuse, child, child abuse as well. Um, but if there is a problem with the caseload, that I am unaware of, we will absolutely move to correct it and we commit to that on the record. Thank you. All right, we're going to Councilmember Gibson, Deutsch, then Brandon. Thank you, Chair Richards. Good afternoon, Commissioner, to you and everyone here. Um, uh, while I have five minutes, I'm gonna try to spit out as much as I can, um, but really wanna thank you for your partnership. Uh, this City Council, since I've been here for seven years, we've worked very, very closely on a number of priorities that are mutually beneficial and that we hear from many of our constituents. So Chair Richards uh, mentioned it and I also want to emphasize civilianization. It's been a topic we've talked extensively about for the past several years, FYs. 16, 17, and 18, we've been able to civilianize about 416 positions. Um, and that's been a great step of progress, but we obviously want to take that to another level. So yes to more civilianization, yes to continued conversations with OMB. And another topic that I always talk about, and my colleagues uh, certainly always talk about, school crossing guards. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen, unfortunately, horrific crashes with children and pedestrians. DOT is doing their part, but I also feel that we have to do more around school crossing guards. The last report that we got from the council in January, we saw a vacancy of 189 positions throughout the city of New York. So while we've provided better recruitment efforts outside of the precinct, we've done a lot, but we want to do more. The working conditions, the salary, majority of school crossing guards are women and women of color. We also want to make sure we have more. The interagency coordination with PD, SCA, DOE has to be tight. As we open new schools in September, the school crossing guards should already be in place. And so I want to understand that where areas are hard to recruit out of that 189, how we can identify that. And I have a question on the mayor's action plan for neighborhood safety. Many of us represent many residents in public housing in NYCHA, our PSAs. Grateful to hear that the youth coordination offices are rolled into housing as well. That's a good thing. But the neighborhood map program, the 15 developments we've had for several years, many have talked to us about expanding that beyond the 15. We've seen a reduction in index crimes in those 15, but in other parts of NYCHA, we've not. We've seen an increase in index crimes. So I wanted to understand what we're doing, how we're working with the administration on the mayor's action plan for neighborhood safety. And I had a quick question, and Commissioner, you alluded a lot around technology, and I appreciate the work the department is doing. Facial recognition, the cell phone towers, stingrays, license plate readers, I don't think it's that unreasonable to ask for a process by which we can make sure that we're holding everybody accountable. So when we have legislation like the POST Act or anything else where we're talking about developing an impact and use policy with a public process for the residents of this city to provide input, I don't think that's unreasonable. So I would love to continue to have dialogue with the department as well as many of our civil rights uh, activists and agencies. We can do both. We can keep people safe and we can respect everyone's individual civil rights. Um, the last question I had, I hope you're taking notes, the capital list. Um, I didn't see the 4-0 precinct in the Bronx, so I want to make sure we're good with funding on that. And Rodman's Neck, the residents of City Island in the Bronx have been living with Rodman's Neck for years. We have a plan to make it noise resistant. I don't know where we are with the Capitol. I understand we're currently in design, but for the sake of the residents of City Island, we need to bring them some relief. And general precinct upgrades, I know we can't upgrade every single precinct, but not just for the workers inside, the people that come in, we have to look at more capital upgrades. HVAC, air conditioning, we talk about that a lot as if it's a luxury, it should be a necessity. Capital upgrades so that everyone feels a sense of pride when they walk in a precinct, but also the staff that work inside feel a sense of pride as well. So I got all my questions out. Now you guys can take my last minute and rock out all my, my questions. Thank you. 
Well, Council members certainly appreciate you affording us the remaining time for uh, us to articulate all your answers. Listen, I, I think there's not a person in the city of New York, if not the state of the country, who would arguably not have their hearts broken by the tragic events of last week with those two uh, kids the last couple of weeks in, in the 75th precinct in East New York. As to your question about the school crossing guards, a, a tremendous undertaking, no doubt. Uh, but this, this, the status of, of where we are today, we are short uh, about 159 school, school crossing guards. Just this week, just this week, 53 school crossing guards finished their training. And that's the second class in the year 2020. The third consecutive month in December, we put out 69 school crossing guards, 53 in January, another 53 that came out this week, and we're slated to hire another 50 plus in March. You spoke of difficulty in recruiting, and we, annot we annotate that and compound it with our social media platforms, of course, on Facebook and Twitter, our build the block meetings, our neighborhood coordination offices. We reach out to our community boards, our community partners, and certainly you. You've played a tremendous role in making sure that we get the word out that the NYPD is hiring school crossing guards. If you overlay that with the fact that we were able to hire approximately 92 level two crossing guards, and we talk about the opportunity for school crossing guards level one for them to move on to a full-time position as a school crossing guard level two which are supervisors who are afforded the opportunity to move resources when someone calls out, to make a little extra money, to have full-time capabilities. And we recognize the tremendous job and how precious our school crossing guards are. And that's why last year in 2019, we had our first school crossing guard ceremony where we honored 39 school crossing guards throughout the city because of all the great work that they do day in and day out. So we'll continue together with you to push out those messages that we are hiring, that we are looking for more school crossing guards, not just police officers and traffic agents and school safety agents, but school crossing guards as well. So thank you for being our partners and thank you for helping us push that message out. Okay, thank you for the update. Thanks. Thanks. Um, you asked about the 40th precinct. It yes. is in construction, so that's moving forward with the $75 million investment in capital that we've made there. Okay. The Rodman's Neck, uh, it is in design, and uh, we do have some progress on the sound abatement. We've identified a temporary sound abatement measure, and we're working to move forward on the procurement for that. And with regard to the precincts, as you're aware, we have a precinct enhancement program, which continues to have $6 million in the baseline. Uh, to work on improving the conditions within the precincts, and there's also continued capital investment for the bathrooms and for the locker rooms and other precinct-specific work. Okay, that's citywide, $6 million? Uh, that, that's on the expense side okay. uh, for ongoing uh, work within Got the Got it, precincts. okay. Thank you. And I'm sorry, can someone answer my question about housing, please? Okay, thank you. Newly assigned uh, Chief of Housing. Um, thank you. Uh, MAP has been very successful over the past years. In the past six weeks, we've took a look at all the developments. Um, right now, in terms of MAP, um, the, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice would have the final say on that, but we are clearly open to expanding it. It's been a very successful program in housing, and uh, we would like to, we would definitely like to expand it. Okay, we'll have to talk to you more offline about that since there are other developments we need to pay attention to that absolutely. are not in the neighborhood MAP program. Yes, ma'am, absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Deutsch, Brannon, Miller. Uh, thank you, good afternoon. Um, firstly, I just wanna say uh, thank you, uh, Police Commissioner, and I mean this literally, thank you for sticking to your guns on bail reform. And uh, I think that a bail reform is a cheap, inexpensive, and easy way out that the state put this uh, law into place. And what we need to do is, is promote and um, prevent people uh, and from going into jails and also to prevent those bail eligible crimes from actually happening and what should be done is that we should double and triple our efforts to reducing gun violence and increasing youth programs and bringing in real mental health resources as well as job training job opportunities and job fairs 
And, and also, when it comes to SYEP, Summer Youth Employment Program, there are thousands of kids who are still left behind, and we need to double and triple our efforts to make sure that these young adults have a place to go during the summer months and also throughout the year. And this is what we need to do, and this is what the state needs to do in order to prevent uh, these incidents from happening. So I commend you and I commend your staff uh, for being very vocal, as I have been since uh, before January, so thank you very much. So my question is, that was just a comment, my question is, is that um, we always say the NYPD is the best in the nation, and we all agree uh, that the NYPD offices are underpaid, and they don't receive the fair market pay. Now, uh, being that here in the city, what we have seen um, since 9-11, all those attempts of uh, uh, terrorism acts and also what happened in in Muncie and also Jersey City that our our schools are uh, underprotected. Uh, we do have a initiative in the city council which is 19 million dollars to, to protect private schools and those schools have private school security and they are state certified they are not certified here by the New York City Police Department or by the New York City uh, at all. So my question is, is that would you support um, in this initiative for private school security for uh, it to be going through NYPD pay detail? So this way we have um, offices, NYPD offices who are protecting uh, these uh, institutions. And secondary, it would also give these offices um, extra uh, opportunity to receive income to support their families. I'll start it off, and I have uh, Deputy Commissioner of Legal Matters, Ernie Hart, who just came up. Um, any, anything that uh, this is, and this is not probably the answer that you want, um, but anything that keeps kids safe, I will absolutely have that conversation. Uh, whether or not we were allowed to do it, I would need more details, but, and I'm not sure if there's anything ongoing regarding that particular issue. I, I, that's, I think that's the uh, point. Um, there are some legal issues, there are some union issues with that. So um, I haven't really spoken to the commissioner about this, but um, if it, it comes to me, I'll take a look at it. But I will tell you that there are some um, issues connected to that. Can um, you just give me like one a legal issue? That well, one, you, one, you one legal issue is having, are we talking about NYPD in private schools. NYPD paid details outside in, in of private, private schools. schools. Well, the paid details is a union issue. And whether or not, uh, because for example, the union believes that a paid detail should be compensated at a different rate over time, for example. We've had this similar problem when we are dealing with um, uh, elections and paid details. So that's, that's a real union issue. So I don't understand. So we're not talking, we're talking about overtime. Let's say if you have a house of worship that um, has security through the NYPD pay detail, why is that any different? I'm just saying it's a union issue. I'm not saying it's impossible. No, we've but, had, we've but had, why? Ernie, I mean, I we've had union issues. I've dealt with the union. With the Board of Election, because that was a state-run agency to have a uniformed officer work in the state. In a private school, it's probably something we could look at. We can have to delve deeper, but uh, again, with the amount of private schools, whether or not there's the personnel available, we're having trouble right now filling all the requests that are coming in. But that is something we could definitely sit down and take a look at. So it's a personnel issue, so it's not a legal issue. No, 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 no I, I'm not saying that. It, it can be a legal issue. There was an issue, for example, at one uh, when uh, you had public school teachers going into private schools. That was something that, has to, that had to be uh, work through. There are legal issues. I'm not saying that's impossible, but I have to take a look at it. That's all. Councilman, a, a, as I said, anything, whether you're talking school crossing guards with that, you know, Fausto talked about two, two young children last week, or safety in general at schools, anything that is going to keep kids safe, we will sit down and have that conversation. And if there's obstacles and we can work around it, we will absolutely have that conversation with you or anyone else on the council. All right, thank you. Uh, Councilman Richards, if I may, since we're already over, but we're among friends, and we always go over. You know, I, I mentioned before committing to reducing the caseload on the child squads, and I just wanted on the record that I was just handed what was posted on our website is the Bronx average caseload is 67.6, Brooklyn is 74, Manhattan is 71.8, Queens is 54.9, Staten Island is 40. When you add those up, 
it is 308. The, uh, the caseload for a child abuse investigator is not 308. That is the adding up of the average of all five. So on the record, um, that, that point is clarified. Thank you. I'm going to go to Councilmember Brannon, Miller, and Perkins. I'm glad to see you're uh, keeping up Commissioner O'Neill's uh, timing uh, uh, consistency. <laughs> Thank you, Only Chair. Only because I took so long at the beginning. We'll figure, we'll, we'll, among friends, we'll add it to the end. Thank you, Chair. Um, Commissioner, can I ask you about Finest Care, the, 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 the uh, mental health pilot that was rolled out? Um, with New York Presbyterian. I wanted to know um, if, if you could give us an idea of how many officers have taken advantage of that program. Well, we, you know, we kicked it off in October of uh, 2019, and uh, we started to get calls immediately from our officers. And so over time, and where we are to date, uh, well over uh, 150 calls. Uh, and I don't have the, the, the figures with me, but, um, but I will tell you that, that um, and preface this by saying two things. One is that when we, when we spoke with uh, New York Presbyterian and we put together our memorandum of understanding as to how we would manage the, the process, one of the things we were concerned about is giving data out. And we, we worked out an arrangement where we built a firewall um, uh, so that we could at least identify how many you know, what the numbers are and get and have them provide us aggregate information, but not officer specific information, as you can imagine. And one of the challenges and the reason for that is because our officers uh, and we recognize that, that there's some stigma attached, perhaps, and we don't want our officers to to uh, actually decide not to take advantage of, of the services that uh, New York Presbyterian uh, is, is, is providing. Um, in that respect because they're worried about confidentiality. So we, we're keeping that confidentiality. We have kept it. Uh, we get uh, some numbers from them uh, on aggregate, aggregate numbers on, on how many people they've seen, on the nature of, of the conditions that they're treating. Um, but we've been reluctant to really give specific data in that regard. Um, so what I'm not looking for anything yeah. more. I mean, you're saying there's been about 150 calls. Yeah, actually, what? people taking advantage. Uh, 90 people came in and, and uh, were, were moved forward in the process. And so we have some of those folks continuing to receive services on a regular basis. OK. Um, there's been a, a lot of talk over the years with the, the IBO and, and some other groups that have looked into um, modifications of, of work schedules that might alleviate some of the stress and, and pressures on the uh, on the officers. Has the department considered any modification to tour length um, and trying to work on the work-life balance and, and that kind of thing? The answer is yes, um, and it's something that has come up um, many times over the years, and it's come up as recently as this week um, internally in discussions. Um, uh, our Office of Management Analysis and Planning, I, I think uh, probably that probably everyone sitting at this table, we have discussed it in some form uh, just in the last two weeks in terms of whether you're talking about 10-hour tours or 12-hour tours or varying shifts. Um, to, to Councilman Lanceman's point earlier, I want data on this as well um, in terms of who is for it, who is against it, what does it really show, what does it show in terms of increased uh, sick, everything, positives and negatives, what does it really cost? Is there increased costs in terms of overtime? So th the short answer is yes, we are looking at it. The, the, the second phase to that answer is we are not at a place yet where we are comfortable making any decisions on altering the existing schedule. But it is still something that is very much on the table. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'll go to Councilmember Miller, followed by Miller Perkins. Thank you, Chair Richards. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioner, you and your team. And thank you for being here. Especially want you, uh, thank you for coming out to Southeast Queens last week. Um, community was well informed and, and it was a good time. Uh, on that, there was a few um, 
unanswered questions and 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 uh, was told that we would receive some of that information and not necessarily at today's hearing but today is as good as time to end to, to talk about some of the things that were um, uh, mentioned there in, in, including um, obviously uh, there was once again a, a very uh, aggressive defense of of um, the position that NYPD has taken on on bail reform, and and so um, obviously it uh, that position requires an answer to the the rise in what we're seeing, or at least what you're seeing, and so um, we've seen um, uh, at least peripherally a number of uh, an increase in the number of stops. Um, stops and frisk um, citywide and particularly in Southeast Queens but we've seen it throughout and discussing it with my colleagues so we'd like to know what those numbers were have we seen I know that um, in January there was an increase are we seeing a, a another increase in, in that and also in your testimony um, there's a statement you, uh, there's statements about the use of technology DNA testing uh, facial recognition um, uh, drones and, and, and alike. And so um, we also asked questions last week about this and uh, we were going to get some clarifications on what policies was to ensure that civil liberties were being uh, respected. So we want to talk about those two. And then finally, the easy stuff is, um, no, I wouldn't say that. Uh, New York City transit or MTA properties and, and, and crime um, has gone up over the past two years, particularly as it relates to MTA employees. Um, last year, uh, during this hearing, we asked for specific data about assaults on uh, those employees. Do you have that data? And if so, what are we doing to resolve and mitigate uh, and keep those employees safe. And then finally, um, commercial truck enforcement. Uh, last year, we passed legislation that went into effect, uh, Local Law 74, uh, which amended Local 74, Law 74, and it went into effect in August. And that was an increase in commercial truck uh, fines, uh, which either exceeded their three hour uh, loading limit or they were parked overnight in residential communities. They went from 250 to 500, from 250 to 500 for the second. They were originally uh, 200, uh, I'm sorry, 250 to 500 for the second. And now they are 400 and 800 for the second. But um, we know that historically throughout the city, that officers are still writing $65 parking tickets, and that does not deter uh, these trucks from parking in these residential communities. So. In, in rapid order, Commissioner Tucker is gonna hit on the stop question of frisk. Chief LaPetri is gonna hit on the assaults on the MTA workers, and then Billy Morris, if you could hit the summonses on the trucks. So, uh, so on the uh, year-to-date numbers, uh, 2019 versus 2020, uh, we're up 3.9% uh, uh, on stops uh, citywide. Uh, and that's, again, that's down, that's with 7,000 fewer arrests. Uh, and, and it's, we had an uptick at the end of 19. So in 19, we had 13,251 stops. Uh, and um, that was up uh, 200 plus um, from 2018. But those numbers are, as, you, as I said, are pretty tiny. Uh, and, uh, and they continue to be, uh, you know, given where we were uh, uh, years ago. The number of stops reported in 2019 represents 71.3 percent decrease uh, from 2014 when we were at 93.1 uh, percent decrease from 2013 as well. So. So the numbers are, you know, they're, not, they're not remarkable. And, and so we haven't, um, we haven't connected, we haven't looked at this in a way that suggests that somehow stops are somehow on the rise. Yeah. 
and the numbers do suggest that they are. They can well, creep back wait, up at this point. Wait, wait. No, I, I mean, when I say they're not on the rise, they're not on the rise with respect to the actual number of stops, we don't think. So uh, the chairman uh, uh, asked a question earlier with respect to the, the auditors. You, uh, when we talked about the budget, we spoke about the budget, and you were asking uh, what the uh, management. management audits were. And uh, so what they are, were they, they are, people that we're hiring in our risk management bureau specifically to look at our quality assurance division, uh, to infuse our quality assurance division with additional staff to, to monitor uh, the number of stops. I mean, one of the things that we've been doing in our work with the monitor, federal monitor over time in these past six years is look at compliance and how we get there. And the way in which we've been getting there is as we bring new procedures on, on board, uh, and we bring our auditors go out and, and um, look at what's happening in, in commands. They, they uh, review body-worn camera video. Uh, they check and ensure that the individuals, uh, our individual officers out there making stops are actually recording those stops. And so compliance really matters in these cases. The fact is, the more we look and pay attention to and send and do the audits, we, we, if we see deficiencies or we believe that uh, officers aren't uh, uh, make, uh, filling out the, 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 the requisite paperwork, um, we begin to see, we believe that it's now getting traction. So, uh, so that would, would account, we believe, for the increase uh, in some cases. Good afternoon. So as far as captioning the, capturing the data on assaults of uh, MTA workers, we do capture that data. So my office does have that data. No, I just don't have it with me. Uh, last year, we, we were slightly down in assaults on, on MTA uh, workers. This year, we see a slight uptick, but it is something that we recognize. Uh, we take it very, very seriously. Actually, right before I got here, I was reviewing a case for CompStat on where an MTA employee was, was assaulted. So it's something that we do look at and we do capture that data. Is that, is that all assaults, including twos and threes, and no matter what level of assault, they're all being captured? I, I, it's all, so if you're assaulted as an MTA worker, it rises to the level of an assault two. So a simple assault is, is an assault two against an MTA employer. Mike, you can get him that information? Absolutely. How long, how long will it take? I can get it to you by today, tomorrow. Uh, Council Member Perkins. Oh, sorry. The, the trucks. I think one more the last person, thing the trucks. The trucks are there, and this is important. But there's one more thing you talked about risk management. Yes. I got a text from uh, a tweet from a uh, constituent, and then I know this happens throughout the city that there are uh, there was a uh, summon serve or a door broken down, and they have been without a front door for the past week, and they were told to call 311. And this is not a new phenomenon that we've seen this in the past. What is the process by which these people, the doors get fixed and, 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 and uh, homeowners are made whole? It's according to exactly the incident happened. If it's a search warrant where we have to make a no-knock entry, we'll make the entry and uh, whoever the super is will be notified to come in and fix it. In that incident, whatever it is, just give it to us afterwards and we'll have it taken care of. Thank you. You, you uh, I'm Bill Morris, I'm the Chief of Transportation. Uh, you questioned before about the overnight commercial parking. Currently under the law, there are two sections for uh, commercial uh, overnight parking. One is code 78 uh, and the other is code six. I'd like to thank you first publicly working with your office and the legal bureau. You had brought this to our attention earlier with your staff, so we followed up with you on it. Just to give you some numbers, uh, Looking at the code 78, which is the $65 summons that you referenced before, in uh, January of uh, this year, we've issued uh, 4,936 of those violations. If we look at the same period in 2019, we issued 5,138. So you can already see as a result of working with you, we're seeing a reduction of uh, almost 4% as far as the $65. At the same time, the overnight, uh, Code 6, which more specifically addresses the larger tractor trailer trucks parked overnight, and as a veteran of the 113 precinct and the 105 precinct, I'm well aware of, of, of the challenges there. Um, already in January of this year, we've issued 24 of those. 
that compares to the same time last year, we had only issued three of them. If you look at all of 2019, we only issued uh, eight summonses for that tractor trailer. So you clearly brought it to our attention. So already this month, we're up about 700% addressing the larger ones with the tractor trailers. You also asked me about the uh, oath summonses. I'm working with the legal bureau to operationalize that just so that the council knows there's a challenge with the service of those oath summonses on the vehicle itself we may actually have to work out a mechanism to have those summonses delivered to Albany in order to constitute service on the trucks. We're working on it, but in the meantime, we, we have instituted the Code 6 for the greater fines. Thank you, Councilmember Perkins. Thank you, Councilmember Miller. Uh, thank you. Can, you. can we get an a overview of some of the uh, steps that we're taking to uh, mitigate the conflict between our youth and their relationship with the police department in their neighborhoods. Can you, are you doing things towards that end that you can share with us today that might be useful in terms of what we can also add to? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Nilda Hoffman, Chief of Community Affairs. So, um, one of the things, first of all, in community affairs, we've been doing a lot of work when it comes to youth. We, first of all, um, if you haven't been there, you have to visit our NYPD Community Center in East New York, 127 Pennsylvania. So the NYPD, um, this is an amazing community center. Um, it used to be a PAL. Um, it was re newly renovated. We have partnered up with the, um, the Child Center at that location. This is a location that has a gym, has a, um, has a dance room, has a music room, has a workout room. And at this location, we is open seven days a week from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. And we have police officers there assigned to our Youth Strategies Division. And um, the location is open to welcome all kids. At, you know, absolutely is free. Um, we have, as you know, the police department has the biggest explorer program. We have close to 4,000 explorers in every precinct, every housing development, I mean, every housing precinct, we have um, explorers also in our transit division. Um, over the summer, we have a six-week camp that we provide 15 locations throughout the city. Um, where police officers, our school safety agents, have um, the young people between the ages of 10 to 15 years old for six weeks. We, besides kind of um, giving them a curriculum similar to what we offer the police officers, we take them on weekly trips. We also partner up with um, our SYEP. We offer within the police department, we offer our young people um, we offer this year, we're gonna offer 350 young people um, jobs, so they'll be spread out through, through the police department, different precincts, different organization. And then finally, that's some of the things that we do for young people, but finally, as the commissioner began, we have, um, we have a new initiative where all our youth officers now in precincts, we've kind of eliminated that and we've began our youth coordination officers. So every precinct will have, every precinct housing development, will ha housing precinct will have youth coordination officers. Anywhere between one up to six police officers, what their task is going to be is everything about young people. Anything from, you know, helping the young people to find something to do in that precinct, from activating spaces, finding you know houses of worship, finding finding parks, to be able to connect these young people to um, kids that come in and might be in trouble from minor you know from maybe a minor offense. Maybe could we um, send them to somewhere else, somewhere else in that community to um, you know to help that young person. Um, these officers, this is going to be rolled out um, March 9th, next week, Monday. These officers are going to be trained. There are about 350 officers citywide, so it's similar and it models under a neighborhood coordination officer. As you know, our neighborhood coordination officer um, are very well, as you know, many meetings that I go to, they are very... Um, engage out there with the neighborhood. So this is similar to that. So this is gonna be youth coordination officers that are gonna be very involved, you know everything there is to know about young people in that community and be able to connect. 
And um, I guess what, you know, one of the things you said, I guess, ended with what else can you do or help as a council? I mean, we get a lot of help from city council, especially when it comes to our explorers. We get a lot of support. But, um, you know, is really helping us to continue to connect our young people to organizations, jobs. One of the things that I hear a lot from young people is they're looking for jobs, full-time jobs. Sorry, I appreciate uh, your response to my question. And, you know, it's a very, very uh, powerful statement that you've made and, 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 and the opportunity that you're creating uh, to bring our young people into alliance, so to speak, uh, with you and the opportunities that that kind of relationship can have. So if there's any way that we and the council or individually can be useful towards some of the work that you're trying to accomplish, I think that's a very, very valuable opportunity. Our young people would very much appreciate it. Well, I think um, one, one, just one of the things too, just recently now, the summer youth program application opened up and we heard from DYCD just in the last two weeks that the many jobs do not get filled because young people do not know about it. So really just giving that information out and letting them know that the jobs are there. And I think that we at the council can be, can be useful in that regard because we do have our newsletters and other means of communicating with our constituents. And so towards that end, please don't hesitate to you know, incorporate us in you know, getting the word out on what you want to try to Thank accomplish. you very much. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, we're going to begin to wrap up. Um, just a few other questions. Uh, what's your position on 50A, and have you made any progress in Albany around, uh, have there been any conversation this session uh, around the conversation of 50A? I mean, every, every conversation that we have regarding 50A, um, Again, I, I feel like uh, I'm beating the drum today, but talks about balance. I think we have to balance the, the concerns of the public to have some of this information and transparency, but we also have to balance it from a workforce in terms of uh, public safety for our have police Have you lobbied officers. thus far, Albany? So, have so you been what, up to what the position is, is mm -hmm. that uh, amend is what my predecessor has stated on the record, and, and I will confirm that is, is likewise my right. position. And I my think question, there's a balance right. that can be struck. Right, and my question is, have you had any conversations with Albany about amending? I know you just- I have not yet, Mongo. not when yet. When do you anticipate you will start that conversation? Unknown at this point in time, but I'm sure that that will be active conversations. Um, okay, we look forward to, to hearing more on that. Uh, wanted to ask about, and this is not to you necessarily, the map uh, program, and this goes back to Chief uh, Chief Barrera. Do I call you Chief now? Or you? What's you should type? Okay, still Chief. Okay, got it. <laughs> He's always been my Chief in Queens. So, I, um, so we talked about extensions, and we've had a lot of conversations around this for a long time. Welcome to the hot seat. Um, it's been the same 15 developments for a while. So, do you have any particular number yeah, on extensions yeah, and when? As you know, the plan, it was very successful. It's run by the mayor's office. Mark Che runs it. Um, we're very amenable um, to, to expanding it uh, and, and moving forward. We can use your help, and, and I welcome it. Uh, budgetary question? Okay, so we look forward to more conversations. Seems to be a lot of conversations happening, but we want to see some progress in these areas. Um, what's the PR budget for the NYPD? Try that. Just wanted to get the number. What's your PR budget? I'm going to have to get back to you on that. Okay. And, and I have many voices, I, I understand now. So although I haven't been up to Albany and professing that, uh, Oleg has on my behalf that, that on the 50A recently. Say, say that again. Oleg has been up speaking on 50A to Albany on my behalf. Well, I like Oleg's smile, but I want to see the commissioner up in Albany. Um, and then uh, just last question, and Rory has one last question. Uh, hate crimes, obviously there was a big uptick there. Police suicides, can you speak to, do you have any new strategies you're implementing around these two areas um, as the new commissioner? Yeah, Rodney will hit the hate crimes quick and then uh, Chief Monahan will just briefly wrap up with the suicide. Mr. Chair, so hate crimes, we're, we're down for the, uh, for the year, uh, 63 versus 65. Uh, we had a uh, concern in 2019 regarding anti-Semitic, we're actually uh, down for the, for the year to date with anti-Semitic 35 versus 41. Uh, we're also down with sexual orientation, hate crimes, uh, four versus six. 
Um, we do see a little bit of a spike. I'll be very transparent in regards to anti-black. Um, we are, we're up 10 versus 3 in, in anti-black uh, hate crimes task force. We do have one arrest um, regarding the, out of the one of the 10, um, if you just give you a quick breakdown regarding the uh, anti-black hate crimes, um, aggravated harassment, uh, first degree, we have three, aggravated harassment, two, we have three, and criminal mischief, fourth, uh, we have four of them. So uh, we take every hate crime seriously. Um, we have 25 investigators, uh, excuse me, um, 18 investigators, 25 people overall in hate crimes task force, and they're working very diligently to, to uh, address every single hate crime uh, with a priority. And graffiti is also a big issue with their have you yeah, increased? Yeah, affirmative. Uh, so uh, we see um, graffiti with the swastikas and other words that are defamatory uh, being utilized uh, too often. Those crimes are somewhat difficult to uh, identify a perpetrator, but yes, that is, that is an issue that we see. All right, and you're, are you funding, uh, I think, are you increasing funding for graffiti removal? specifically for this area, or are we going to keep it flat? We've had recent conversations in terms of the uh, our Crime Stoppers program to expand it to cover this type of crime. Now that's ongoing and, and nailing down the details. And may I suggest we fund uh, organizations that do cleanups, so if there's coordination, there may be some synergy. Not that I want the council's resources used for this, but, um, but there certainly could be some synergy um, between us and you a little bit more in the graffiti. Um, Okay, uh, Cohen, and then Lanceman, and then we're done on question. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I'll be I, very brief. I just, uh, I have a lot of quality of life issues, that, which I'm fortunate that uh, in, in the 5 and in my portions of the 5-2, and even and in the 4-7, uh, fortunately there's not a lot of serious crime, and I, I'm very grateful for that. Uh, but it does lead to some issues of trying to get enforcement of the sort of lower level stuff um, I don't know if you have any details on, uh, you know, like if it's not traffic enforcement trying to get, you know, if there's a car parked at a hydrant and you call it in, it's very hard to get enforcement uh, on those kinds of things. Um, I don't know if you have any information about that, about the number of summonses written by non-traffic agents. Yeah, uh, Chief Pichardo, the Chief of Patrol, will, I don't know if he has those specific numbers, but he'll just talk to, in generally, our response to quality of life complaints and, and what an emphasis we place on it. Yeah, certainly, and I think as, as many in this room sitting to my right and certainly at the table here know, as former precinct commanding officers, uh, one of the chief, if not the chief complaint in any meeting, community council meeting, community board meeting, public safety meeting, really encompasses quality of life concerns as you alluded to, double park cars, driveways, et cetera. Uh, and that's really the cornerstone of neighborhood policing. So I don't have the data specifically uh, for the 5-0 and block driveways and other concerns, but I can certainly talk to you afterwards and get that information to you. But I will ask that uh, we want to make sure that as we move into our fifth year uh, neighborhood policing, and, and some of us are traveling around the whole city just to get feedback really from, from the ground on, from the, the people in the street in the city of New York. Let us know what, how's it working, what, what can we do better to serve the 8.6 million New Yorkers. Uh, I want to make sure that they're also connected to our neighborhood coordination officers and our study sector officers so that those core root quality of life problems don't evolve and manifest into something else. Yeah, I, I think, oh, go ahead, please. What I was just going to finish up and say, um, we all the time, we talk about the major crimes, we talk about terrible tragedies, the shootings, the homicides, the sexual assaults, but oftentimes this, this conversation doesn't come up. We, we remain committed to addressing the quality of life for all the reasons Fausto said. These are the complaints that overwhelmingly we get throughout the city at community meetings, whether it's through 311. These are the ones that affect New Yorkers day in and day out. I think we can do better. I'll be perfectly frank. I think we can do better. I know that Mike LaPetri shares that vision. Mike chairs our CompStat meetings. And, and I think that you know, on, on quality of life, whether it's a block driveway, whether it's people hanging out, whatever the complaint is, shame on us if we don't, don't do everything to, to connect to that person, to tell them what the results were of the complaint. It may not always be to their liking. It may not always be 
a summons or an arrest, we give our officers discretion too. But we, we, we need to close that loop, in my opinion, in terms of people complaining and feeling they got the service they deserve. So that's my commitment. I know that Mike shares it. We'll, we'll look to improve in that area. I appreciate that. I, I recently had a sit down with, uh, I think he's a cap Captain Melendez, who's at the 50th, who I, I know you were back there in the day. Um, and when we talked about, I don't, you know, I don't know, and maybe again, it's a, a good conversation to have, uh, but he talked about discretion, that a lot of the officers have discretion, because, you know, I'll often make 311 complaints myself. You know, I see something, I call it into 311, and I'll often, you know, see the response where the police responded and decided no action was necessary, and I'll drive by, and well, that's interesting, because that car is still parked at that height. <laughs> I, I think that discretion is very important, and it's a, a very important tool to have, and I, and I think that's a positive. But I also have said many times, and they've heard me say this at Comstats, at the end of the day, the people that live on the block, the people that live in the window, the people that can't get sleep at night, shouldn't be frustrated by our response. So I'll end it with that. And that discretion is positive, but we have to be responsive. Uh, I'll just lastly say I'm thrilled to see Nilda Hoffman. She was great when she was at the 5-2. Uh, I uh, already uh, miss uh, Chief Nikunin and uh, also Tommy Alps is phenomenal, so thank you. All right, Lanceman, very briefly. So the Wall Street Journal uh, reported that the department lost 125 officers to the uh, MTA uh, in January or, or December, um, mainly because the, the pay is so much better. Um, can you tell us how damaging is it to the department to be unable to retain officers who are experienced, who we have invested so much money into training because the city won't pay them a salary comparable to what they can get in other jurisdictions. So it can be frustrating at times um, to, lose, to lose employees to other jurisdictions. The, the positive here, if there is a, a positive is that when you write across the country now, we go to a lot of conferences, many of us here, and I, I read one article today, I don't remember the jurisdiction. There are, there are jurisdictions in this country, law enforcement, that have, are having serious recruiting shortages and problems, not only retaining people, hiring people, that they, they have positions that they can't fill. The positive is we are not in that situation. We retain a very healthy pool of applicants, um, we re literally recruit from across the globe. Um, but, but back to your point, uh, Councilman, um, certainly it, it can be frustrating at times to go through the entire applicant process, to which there is a cost. The recruitment, the advertising which just came up, the selection, the screening, the police academy, and then to lose them after a couple years. Uh, it is not a new phenomenon. This is something that we've seen, whether it's to uh, our, our, our brothers and sisters out east in Nassau, Suffolk County, certainly many places in Rockland County, the Port Authority. Um, uh, it's something they're aware of. We're, we're able to withstand the loss right now, but th the short answer is, uh, do, I, do I wish it didn't happen? I, I wish it didn't happen. All righty. Well, I want to thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Oh, what am I doing? Well, well, Mr. Commissioner, you know, um, every time a commissioner comes, they got, they got stops, hard stops uh, during the budget uh, hearings when the commissioner comes. So we want to we be consistent in keeping you over your time. I, I want to thank everyone. You like spending time. I want to thank everyone um, <laughs> at the dais for your, your questions, concerns. Thank you so much. We look forward to working with you. Thank you. DCRB here.
righty, we're going to begin again. Good evening and welcome to the second portion of the Public Safety Committee Fiscal 2021 Preliminary Budget Hearing. We welcome the Civilian Complaint Review Board here today and look forward to your testimony. I also like to remind everyone that the public will be invited to testify at 5 p.m., but we could start subsequently before if things progress here. CCRB's Fiscal 2021 budget is $20.4 million. Most significantly for their budget, voters approved a measure to, to tie the CCRB st staff headcount to the NYPD's uniform headcount. This ensures CCRB will receive adequate resources and remain an effective check on the police department. This year, we commend the CCRB on tackling new challenges like investigating sexual misconduct claims, outreach to communities in support of the Raise the Age legislation, and investigations that now involve body-worn camera footage. We also cannot overstate their success in prosecuting Daniel Pantaleo. This has brought some semblance of justice to communities all around New York City and the country as a whole. I look forward to hearing about developments in your budget, your outlook for the next year, and about any concerns you might have. Thank you to CCRB Chair of the Board, Reverend Fred Frederick Davey, and Executive Director Jonathan Darsh, as well to your staff for being here today. You may begin. Thank you. I'm and I'm going by to Council do Member Lanceman. I'm going to do an abbreviated version of the testimony. Great. Um, and you have the full testimony, I think, uh, before you. So Chairperson Richards, members of the Public Safety Committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. As you know, I'm Frederick Davey, Chair of the Civilian Complaint Review Board, and I'm joined by my colleague, uh, our Executive Director, Jonathan Darsh. As you have already pointed out, there have been several significant developments for the CCRB over the past year including the CCRB's prosecution of Dan Daniel Pantaleo for the killing of Eric Garner and Mr. Pantaleo's uh, subsequent termination from the New York City Police Department. November's successful ballot initiative resulting in changes to the New York City Charter that have an, have an impact on CCRB's work, the completion of the Memorandum of Understanding between the CCRB and the NYPD to help improve the CCRB's access to body-worn camera footage, and the launch of the agency's Civilian Assistance Unit, which seeks to provide our complainants with assistance and connect connection to needed city services. In addition, in 2019, the CCRB received 4,959 complaints um, in its jurisdiction, the highest number of complaints received since 2013, and about a 4.5% increase over last year's 4,745. CCRB's complaints have risen nearly 16% since 2016, a rise that is at least partially attributable to the agency's recent focus on community outreach and public education. Each of, these turns of event, each of these turns of events have had considerable influence on the practice of police accountability um, at the CCRB. On November 5th, also as you noted, New Yorkers voted to implement a set of charter changes grouped together on the ballot to initiative that made the disciplinary process more transparent, strengthened the CCRB's oversight capabilities, and now improved the agency's efficiency. Among these changes is, is that the CCRB's headcount, as you noted, will be linked uh, to 0.65 percent of the NYPD's uniform officer headcount. The CCRB has been in close communication with the city's Office of Management and Budget, OMB, to determine exactly how many additional staff members this will mean for the agency. At the close of FY 2019, the CCRB's authorized headcount was raised by 16 percent from 183 to 212 people. And as a result of the revised charter language, another 17 staff members were added in the July plan, the January plan. While the charter guarantees headcount, there's no specific funding levels attached to that headcount. And so we have worked closely with OMB to determine what these new personnel lines will be. Similarly, we continue to discuss with OMB what, the level of, what level of support is available for infrastructure items like workspace, computers, desks, external training modules, and office network access, all covered under categories of other than personnel services, specific funding for which is also not guaranteed by the new charter language. In 2019, 58% of CCRB's fully investigated complaints featured video evidence. Nearly 60% of these cases with video featured 
B, uh, BWC footage. And 74% of the cases involving BWC evidence are closed uh, on the merits. In other words, as substantiated, exonerated, or unfounded. Because the facts of these cases are more uh, clearly determined when there is BWC footage. In complaints with no video evidence, only 40% are closed on the merits. In 2017, the year B the BWC program launched, the CCRB received 158 BWC video files of roughly 37 gigabytes. In 2019, the CCRB received 8,000 BWC video files of roughly 1.3 terabytes, a 3,385% increase. Body-worn camera evidence is vital to the CCRB's investigations and has had a massive impact on our work. This also highlights the importance of the MOU Memorandum of Understanding between the CCRB and the NYPD on how to access BWC recordings. Once this new protocol goes into effect, CCRB investigators will be able to search for BWC footage in collaboration with NYPD staff, view re unredacted footage, and take notes on content and request for downloads of sections of video that are relevant to the investigation and the prosecution of allegations of misconduct in the case. The agency has, always, has also continued to work to support the needs of our complainants. Sexual misconduct, an, an allegation category the CCRB took on in February 2018, was one of the reasons the agency has worked to create a civilian assistance unit. This innovative unit will um, will support comp this innovative unit will support complaints by six complainants by assisting them in understanding and na navigating the investigatory and disciplinary processes um, that provide complainants with connections to cr critical uh, city services like housing assistance and mental health services. Advocates for at-risk populations often cite that the CCRB's process is too difficult for their members to navigate. Members of the public at board meetings often, often speak about the fact that the CCRB's process is too difficult and emotionally taxing, and the investigators and prosecutors anecdotally report that witnesses complain that the, processes, the process causes them emotional distress and they, they decline to follow through with their complaint. The CAU will pair complainants with social workers and counselors who help them mitigate uh, pro-event, post-event trauma and aid them in navigating uh, New York's network of support services in a meaningful way. As a part of its overall, as a part of its oversight and accountability work, under its charter mandate, the CCRB engages in a wide variety of public awareness efforts. Since the beginning of the current administration, the CCRB's out outreach unit has expanded significantly, both in size of its staff and in its baseline funding. The unit has diligently focused on reaching larger audiences and building relationships with community stakeholders, service providers, elected officials, and advocates. However, the agency continues to face challenges regarding public awareness of the CCRB and its powers and resources. We know that this awareness is extremely consequential. While many members of the public who encounter our outreach staff continue to report a previous lack of knowledge of the agency, we'll continue to work with other city agencies to agencies to discuss, uh, the, uh, uh, to discuss ways to spread public awareness of the CCRB. And I, I want to just go off script here and, and just say a word about uh, the continued need for the CCRB to have uh, support for uh, public engagement in public education, and particularly public education. And maybe we can talk some more about that in the Q&A, but I don't want that point to get missed because I think it's crucial. Uh, to the agency's ability to effectively serve the, the citizens of the city. With the support of the administration, the city council, the agency continues to be better able to accomplish its mission to provide strong, effective, and independent civilian oversight for the New York City Police Department. But there is more to be done. I am confident that with your help, the CCRB will continue to flourish, improve, and lead the way in civilian oversight nationally. Thank you for your time and continued support and we're open to any questions you might have. Thank you, Thank you Chairman. Uh, let me just start off. So in your testimony, uh, you said since 2013, uh, you've seen a 4.5 increase over last year's, I'm sorry, the highest, you've seen the highest numbers of complaints you received since 2013. 
Um, what do you think is a large contributor of those, uh, the increase in complaints? So I'll start and then I'll turn it over to, uh, to, to John. Um, I think we, we have a pretty excellent uh, community outreach team mm -hmm. and they have worked hard to connect to community-based organizations uh, to provide more information on the agency and its work. Um, and I suspect also um, with the Pantaleo case, the agency has been uh, more high profile as well. But I'll turn to John and see if you have anything additional to add. The chair is right about those, those two factors, but two additional factors are the enactment of the Right to Know Act created an additional uh, class of uh, allegation that can be made against a police officer, as well as the CCRB's determination to investigate instead of refer sexual misconduct uh, complaints. I think those two, all, those two, uh, those two decisions are also impact the increase of complaints. So, Helen, did you want to come now? I'm sorry. I'm just going to, we just had a, to make a correction on the record. She wanted to make a correction. Thank you so much, Chair Donovan. For the record, I just wanted to correct that uh, the number of detectives per case in the child squad is um, 64 detectives per, um, sorry, 64 cases per detective. This year, last year, it was 88 cases um, per detective. And I want to apologize to the police commissioner for that math error on my part. I want to reiterate that um, there just aren't enough detectives in the special victims division to take care of the number of rape cases that come through the door. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member. All right, let's get back to uh, recent budget changes now. Uh, let's talk about the main changes to your budget, which are two headcount increases. Uh, first, as part of the adopted budget last year, the council successfully negotiated with the administration to fund 24 new investigators. Uh, what's the status of those 24 positions? So the agency worked hard to fill those positions. We are very close to our headcount right now. So we filled all 24? Y yes. Okay. Um, and can you tell me uh, how has this impacted your investigative unit? Have you observed the benefits? Has it helped reduce caseload? So one of the, I think it's been very, it's been vital, that increased headcount into letting us stay as effective as we have been. Body-worn camera footage has, has really almost uh, swept through the agency in the investigative process, which has caused our dockets to increase and case investigation times to increase. And without those new staff, we would have, we would have suffered even worse. Right. And I noticed, um, Chairman, in your testimony, uh, you said in 2019, 58% of the CCRB's fully investigated complaints featured video evidence. Um, uh, nearly 60% of these cases with video featured body-worn cameras and 74% of the cases involved body-worn camera evidence as well. Um, can you speak to the 58% number? You want to talk about that? Sure. Why not 100%? Mr. So, Mr. Chair, I think you're saying w why doesn't every case have body-worn camera footage? Right. Okay. Yes. So there are some instances where members of service may not turn on a body-worn camera because they either don't think they have to or they, uh, or they are required not to for particular reasons. Like if there is a victim of a sex crime, they're instructed not to turn it on. Uh, so do we have a breakdown of that when they don't turn it on? And I know you have a report, I think, that you're going to no, issue sure. soon, right. some recommendations. Yeah, we, um, we, we issued our report, was it last week? Yes. Yeah, um, but we can either find that now or we can Actually, give it to you. Actually, you're right, you did, uh, I know Tiffany, yeah, yes, they got it, okay. Uh -huh. So, but I, I will note that if the board decide, determines that a member of service should have had their camera on and didn't, 
then we will note that for the department to discipline the member of service. And how many instances have you had to do I that? I can get back to you with that number. Okay. Uh, let's get back to the budget. Can you explain why there are 10 positions listed under the financial plan savings that do not have funding? Are there no plans to hire for these positions? I'll get back to you on that, Mr. Chair. I don't, I don't have an answer for that. Okay. Um, the second major headcount addition was part of the November financial plan as part of the proposed charter revisions in, no, in the November ballot. On the November ballot, voters approved five proposals for CCRB. Um, the main budgetary revision was to tie CCRB's B budget to 0.65% of the NYPD's uniform budget. How many positions will be added uh, to uh, the budget for fiscal year 2021 uh, based on this revision? So our, our current information from the Office of Management and Budget is that 17 positions will be added. Okay. We've already taken steps with our training staff and uh, with the investigations division to make sure that when uh, those positions become available, we're ready to bring them on board. So that'll be 17 additional positions. And uh, is this still uh, a, it's a step in the right direction? Do you still believe you need more staffing? Always. <laughs> Should we do another? Would you support another charter revision? How would an increase? Get there, sure. <laughs> Um, all righty, and uh, okay, and which position do you plan on hiring for with the 17? So, so the agency is still determining what is the best mix of people to bring on board mm -hmm. and is working with the Office of Management and Budget to make sure that we have the funding to bring on the right mix of people for those positions. Uh, but clearly we need more investigators to uh, to meet the, the increased demands of caseload on the staff that we have to investigate the cases we have. Okay, let's stay on body cameras again, go back to body cameras. So I know uh, CCRB signed an MOU to share body camera footage in a shared room at CCRB's office with the NYPD. When will this begin? Has it begun? Uh, it hasn't begun, but staff is working with the NYPD and City Hall to uh, get it underway uh, more quickly, and maybe John has more specifics on that. So the, the agreement originally envisioned using the 12th floor of 100 Church Street, uh, and then splitting that floor, half would be for additional CCRB personnel, and then half would be an NYPD facility for the secure room and additional office space for them. That, the 12th floor, we had thought would be available and is not available, and we've been working very closely with the department, with uh, City Hall, with DCAS, with Office of Management and Budget, and we've located a temporary space to set up a secure room and additional office space for the NYPD. Where will that be? That's gonna be on the 10th floor of 100 Church, which is where our offices are right now. And okay. And uh, we think that PD will be in that space uh, in early May and that the secure room should be up and running by June. Okay, so, so everything running by June? Correct. Okay. Um, let's hop around to the Civilian Witness Assistance Unit. CC, I know you've been trying to fund this unit to help intake victims of sexual misconduct by police officers. OMB was able to fund one position in the November financial plan but didn't fully fund this unit to the five people you asked for. Um, has there been any progress there or are we still having conversations? So the, the current plan is that there is a, a I'm going to call it an RFP, but I don't think that is the actual technical term, I apologize to you all, but uh, to bring on the staff uh, through a third party to work for the director. Uh, that process, uh, we haven't found a vendor so far. If we're unable to find a vendor, we're working with uh, the Office of Management and Budget and with City Hall to try and find another solution to give us the staff to open up the civilian assistance unit, I think all parties are committed to having that happen. And why do you need a third party? I'm confused. So I think it was felt that it would be beneficial to the city's 
fiscal situation to have it done that way. But they could just fully fund CCRB to do this work, correct, a unit? And, and that may end up being how, the, how we go, but we're working with the Office of Management and Budget and City Hall to, to fund the positions. Okay. And you anticipate everyone uh, in this unit would get FETI training? So I think that's, I don't know that they would need FETI training. I think we're gonna try and make sure that our investigators and intake personnel and prosecutors have the FETI training. Okay, and they're, they're the only ones who currently get FETI training in CCRB? And not the only ones, there are some additional folks, but generally that's where we wanna focus most of the FETI training. Okay, let me just go into, um, can you tell us the difference between phase one and phase two cases? and whether you've begun investigating phase two cases? I can say, I will say that um, the phase one investigations are well underway. Um, and can and you just explain what phase one is for the public? You want to? So the, when the agency was trying to figure out how best to undertake the investigation of sexual misconduct, we were able to divide these types of allegations into two groups. The first was sexual harassment. Phase one was sexual harassment cases. And the second was sexual assault cases, uh, which we considered phase two. And we felt that the phase one investigations were close enough to the work that we were already doing, investigating uh, discourtesy and other types in offensive language cases that we were able to start those investigations right away, and so we've begun investigating those already. The, the phase two cases we are not investigating yet, and we don't anticipate investigating those until the CAU is fully up and running. We've been working extremely hard as an agency to make sure that when the CAU is ready to go, the agency will be able to begin investigating phase two sexual misconduct cases. 2019, there were 114 closed sexual misconduct allegations. Um, can you tell us how many of those were substantiated and what type of discipline do you recommend in these types of sexual misconduct cases? Well, sure. um, so you ask for the number of closed cases? Substantiated. Substantiated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we had 16%, uh, 72 allegations, 16%, uh, 245 allegations, and 168 complaints. Uh, there are 72 allegations pending. Of the closed allegations, 16% were substantiated, 6% were unfounded, 7% uh, had member of service unidentified, 20% uh, unsubstantiated, 49% truncated, and 1% were other. So 16% were substantiated. And can you speak to what type of, of those uh, discipline is rec recommended in these substantiated cases? So generally in our, f in our discipline framework, those, those allegations are generally have, uh, the presumption is that they would have charges, but there may be reasons to not have charges in the case, and we would have to get back to you on the breakdown of uh, discipline for every substantiated the discipline recommended for every uh, substantiated phase one sexual misconduct allegation. Right, and then uh, half of the cases were truncated, so can you just speak a little bit more to why half were truncated? Well, that's, that's generally when um, we can't get the complainant or witnesses to actually uh, participate in bringing the cases to conclusion, but I'll let John talk more specifically about that if you want. I think the agency has always been concerned with the truncation rate for as long as I've been at the agency. One of the things we're doing differently now is the Blake Fellow is really working hard to get to the root causes of truncation and what we can do better as an agency to reduce truncation. Uh, and I'm hopeful that we're gonna get the first report uh, from the Blake Fellow, the, the inaugural Blake Fellow out soon so that we could begin working on uh, her recommendations. 
and uh, I would assume it's staffing is a big challenge still um, in striking while the iron is hot, as we would say, because if you let time go by, you know, people are less likely to follow through, and that gets me into caseloads for a second. Um, so um, look at the caseloads, if you could pull that slide up. Um, your time to complete investigations um, increase in FY19 as compared to FY18 from 190 days to 249 days. Um, can you speak to the reasons for the increase in case times? I'll just say I think it's probably related to access to body-worn camera footage before anything else. But I, obviously John deals with this every day, and you can say more. One of the reasons we're so uh, we're, we, we are anticipating eagerly the going live in the secure room is because of how important it is for us to get access in a timely manner to body-worn camera footage. Uh, the, the explosion of video has really uh, caused delays in our casework and caused the explosion of dockets. And access is still a challenge, I'm assuming, even as you wait. It, it will be resolved when we can implement the MOU but as long as it's not implemented, we have those same access issues. And let me ask you this. Um, and it still have not been as cooperative. Would you say the NYPD can still be more cooperative in this period? And even with the new investigators, you still are finding it hard to so close the, caseloads? I think if you, while the, MOU has not been fully implemented. There have been aspects of it that have been implemented, such as uh, streamlining the waiver process. And I think in while full implementation of the secure room is really necessary to get, uh, to get the process more streamlined, I don't think it is uh, certainly at the highest levels of the Deputy Commissioner of Legal Matters Office, they are working hard to get us the footage we need. And I, I think I should, and I would like to just um, give my colleagues at the NYPD um, some credit for having worked with us to actually produce this, this, this MOU. Um, it is, um, there's always room for improvement, there's always more that we can do, but this is a big step. Um, and, and, and they took it with us and now we just need to be able to implement it and, and, get, and get on with it. Got it. Uh, I'm going to go to Councilman Lanceman before I do. Um, so I'm looking at data, and in the 44th precinct, we saw 20 members had uh, of the NYPD had substantiated complaints that were closed in 2019 alone. Um, can you comment on whether you see it as a problem when specific precincts have more substantiated complaints than others, and what steps the CCRB take? I think in outreach in an instance where you see more substantiated cases at specific precincts? So, so again, preliminary comments on my part. I think that um, one of the things that we've tried to do is where we see where we have precincts where there are high levels of substantiations. We've tried to hold community meetings in those precincts, um, both in terms of our CCRB meeting and where we have public testimony. And we try to hear from both uh, members of, of the of NYPD as well and especially the public as to what the dynamics are and the interactions are between the precincts and the uh, and the and the people that uh, live in those live in those areas. And um, that's been uh, very helpful in in helping us to understand uh, how better to relate and respond to people in those communities. Um, also, the community outreach team works with community-based organizations and precincts where there are higher incidents of uh, substantiations. So those are two things that we're doing, um, and, and obviously conversations with um, the NYPD about what we're seeing and why, um, and the sharing of that information back and forth helps to address that some too. But I'll turn it over to John, so he has additional things to add. We We've uh, improved our information sharing with the department a great deal. We now give them monthly reports on uh, new complaints that are coming in by the individual member of service and what command and uh, assignment they have. 
so that they're better able to track what's going on. But I think as to, to what the department is doing about the, to address it, if there are any other larger issues is something that you would really have to talk to them about rather than us. Thank you. Council Member Lantzman. Thank you. Forgive me if some of these were asked already. They weren't asked by me. Um, I want to understand the, the process and the staffing that's necessary for um, the CCRB's new jurisdiction to include uh, false statements made, false official statements made to the, to the CCRB. W when does that take effect? Immediately? January 1st? So I think uh, it's either March 31st or April 1st it'll go into effect. Got it. The, because the CCRB has been studying false official statements and then referring them to the department for them to determine whether misconduct occurred for many years now, and we have been, our investigators are trained to make those determinations, it was more of a process related change into how are you going to, you know, we had to update our computer systems and make sure people knew which drop downs to do, but we're ready for the go live and there wasn't much that we had to do to train people differently than they were already getting trained. Got it, that's good to hear. Um, have, have you and do you need to engage in any kind of uh, dialogue with the NYPD to, to, to set up any kind of uh, mechanism so you're handling this instead of them or Again, it's just everything's already been in place. It's a matter of now you can file those, those charges or whatever that next step is. It, it, it should be, hopefully, it should be smooth. I don't anticipate issues. Okay, good. Um, the issue of the CCRB's headcount being linked to the NYPD's NY, the uniform officer headcount, I'm sure it's in here, but, but how, how many more uh, people does that mean come to work for the CCRB? 17 is what we've talked about, but, you, but that's complicated. So we originally thought there was going to be 24 uh, people, but uh, we have some uh, per diem personnel at the agency who are not on our uh, official headcount. And so the Office of Management and Budget counted them and subtracted them from the 24 to get to 17. Yeah. And, and you're get, that's what you're getting? So we're still in negotiation with them. I'm, I'm hopeful that maybe we could get one or two more bodies out of them. Okay. Because my recollection is the mayor supported these charter reforms. I, I believe. Well, probably, yes, yeah. more or less. Um, Lastly, I, I want to ask about the civilian assistance unit. So it's not up and running yet. Correct. We have the director, but we don't have the staff yet. Got it. And, and it may or may not be staffed by an outside organization. Correct. And, and it's contemplated that it's much more than just like a pro se office for the CCRB. It's not just helping the litigants. The, the it's not just helping a complainant fill out a complaint form, right? It's trying to get them services, et cetera? Correct. Good. All right. Well, you know, for what it's worth, I don't have a, a firm opinion one way or the other whether it should be something that's done in-house or, or contracted out. Um, but, you know, certainly there are a lot of nonprofit organizations that have a tremendous amount of experience uh, serving uh, people who are victims of, sadly, any number of kinds of categories of offenses, whether it's domestic violence or sexual assault, you, you name it. And so uh, it'll be interesting to see how you, how you work through that. Do you, do you have a preference? My preference is to have it up and running as soon as possible. So whatever can get us, uh, get the program up and running quickest is what I'm in favor of. And I think one of the, one of the ways it's going to really help is so many, uh, people who feel victimized by the criminal justice system have other issues, other traumas that are affecting them other than uh, just being, uh, having interactions with the NYPD. They may have uh, housing issues. They may have uh, mental health issues. There are all sorts of things that people come to our agency where they're bringing 
problems with them or issues with them that have nothing to do with their interaction with the NYPD. And we're hopeful that the Civilian Assistance Unit will be able to get them the services they need uh, in a way that will help us at the CCRB complete our investigations, but also help them as human beings be better people. I would think if, if they have a housing issue or they have an immigration status issue and they drop off the radar screen um, to deal with those problems or as a result of those problems, it's probably hard to get them to come and, and testify and, and do all the things you need to do to complete your investigation. So for what it's worth, I, I, I wholeheartedly support um, this effort. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming in. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, and thank you for the work you're doing. Sure. Great you. work Great. last year. Let's keep building on it. Thank you. Mayor, give them more staffing. <laughs> all righty. <laughs> all righty. We're going to call Shane Correa. Center for Court Innovation, Emily R Marie Ramos, Just Leadership, East Harlem, Preservation, Green Workers, and who represents all five boroughs through now, Workers Co-op Academy, Ashley Sawyer, Girls for Gender Equity, Ralph Palladino, First Vice President, Local 1549, John McFarland, Vocal New York and CPR, Wearing a lot of hats. And Brandon Holmes, Just Leadership USA. I'm going to call you again. John McFarland, Vocal New York, CPR. Ralph Palladino, First VP, Local 1549. Missed you Monday. Second. <laughs> Thanks for the promotion. <laughs> Ashley Sawyer, Girls for Gender Equity, Emily Marie Ramos, Just Leadership, John, Shane Correa, Center for Court Innovation, Brandon Holmes, Just Leadership. If you're going to read all of this, it's you were really going to read all of this? It's longer than the police commission says. No. Okay. That's for staff homework. <laughs> Documentation, like we do with grievances. <laughs> That's why we win them. <laughs> Not this case. But. <laughs> all right, we're going to start with the ladies first. So you state your name for the record. Uh, okay, perfect. Still going to start with the ladies. Uh, so we'll start from here. State your name for the record, who you're representing, and then you may begin. Hi, my name is Press your button. Hi, my name is Emily Marie Ramos. Um, I am an Afro-Borica woman who was born and raised in New York City. Uh, I grew up in the Lower East Side in Lillian Wald Houses in New York City Public Housing um, and was raised in East Harlem in East River Houses. Um, I'm here representing uh, Jaime Madre, which is a women and femme of color marijuana cooperative, um, Nick Knock, which is New York City Network of Worker Cooperative, which is a trade association for worker cooperatives in New York City, Green Worker Cooperative, which is a business incubator program out of the South Bronx, um, East Harlem Preservation, which is a nonprofit um, fighting gentrification in East Harlem and Just Leadership USA, um, which is launching a campaign to stop the investment in prisons and the criminal justice system, and close Riker Island, and invest in communities. Um, I come to this work as someone who has been personally harmed by the criminal justice system in New York. Um, I don't say judicial system because I'm defining the system by how it functions, and it does not work to reduce crime. Uh, it creates the perfect conditions, the breeding grounds for criminal activity. Um, we want to focus on tackling issues at the root of the problem, which most of the time is poverty. Um, as we saw from the police presenting earlier, there are increases in crime, 17% increase in index crimes, increase in, in murders. Um, so this system is clearly not sustainable. 
Um, we should be measuring the um, success of this system, not by its expansion and growing of prisons, convictions, and crime, because um, clearly that means that someone is not doing their job. Um, we should be measuring the success of these systems by the reduction of prisons, by the reduction of prisoners, by the reduction of crime, by the reduction of convictions. And the way that we could do that is not by extending, expanding criminal services um, and the criminal justice system and policing, it's by investing in communities and tackling problems at the root of them, um, which often um, result from poverty. So that's investing in education, investing in healthcare, investing in career training, investing in affordable housing, investing in business incubator programs, initiatives like the Worker Cooperative Business Development Initiative um, in New York City. Um, support entrepreneurs because they're good for the community. They're a part of the community. They spend their dollars in the community, which stimulates local economy, and they often give back to the community. I am a worker owner and do a lot of advocacy and organizing within New York City. Um, we host educational forums throughout New York City to educate people on where the legislation, the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act is in New York, how it affects our community, how they can be affected in legalization, whether they'll be prioritized and licensed, how the tax revenue will be reinvested in our community, how the harms will be repaired for people who have been harmed by prohibition, reentry services for people who are coming out of prison. Um, my father was someone who was arrested um, for marijuana in 1993 when my mother was pregnant with me. He was arrested from Baruch houses in the Lower East Side. My ap grandparents' apartment was raided, guns were put in my grandmother's face, and my dad spent 12 years in prison because of a marijuana conviction. While people in other states right now are making billions of dollars on the marijuana industry, while Governor Cuomo and the New York State Senate and House are saying that it's inevitable that we're going to legalize marijuana in New York. We just want to make sure we get it right. My dad is still living with my grandparents, not able to get into affordable housing. He's barred from entering NYCHA because of the laws. He was barred from accessing funding for higher education, so he couldn't get a college degree. He was barred from traditional employment. He had to start his own business, and he is still struggling. So even though I'm 26 years old now, 26 years later, I'll be 27 this year, my dad is still trying to rebuild his life after the harm of marijuana prohibition. This criminal justice system is not working. Most of the people in prison right now are for marijuana and drug-related crimes. We decriminalized marijuana in New York in 1977. Since then, over a million people have been arrested for marijuana-related crimes, and most people in New York City. And of those, 86% were black and brown people. When are we going to stop this system that is attacking our people? And when are we going to be investing in resources and community services that actually support and build our community, that actually give people in our community a future um, that allows us to create intergenerational wealth? We can't pass down a job. You can't pass down an apartment, especially if you live in NYCHA because of remaining family member and succession rights. But you can pass down a home, you can pass down land, you can pass down a business. You can pass down any type of cooperative, whether it's a producer cooperative, if you're growing your own food, a consumer cooperative, and you have your own grocery market. There's all these different types of ownership that we should be investing in in our community so that our community is able to support and sustain itself, because the criminal justice system is not sustainable. And this is not something new. Uh, we know from- I'm going to ask you to wrap up. I'm sorry, really quick. No um, Angela Davis's work on prison abolition, um, her book, Are Prisons Obsolete? Violence Against Women and the Ongoing Challenge to Racism, Abolition Democracy Beyond Empire Prisons and Tortures, The Meaning of Freedom, um, Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, Ava DuVernay's 13th, uh, her documentary on Netflix, um, George Lipset's The Possessive Investment in Whiteness, Paula Iwanide, the Emotional Politics of Whiteness, How Feelings Trump Fact in the Age of Colorblindness, Kimberly Crenshaw, Say Her Name, Resisting Police Brutality Against Black Women, uh, Khalil Gibran Muhammad um, from the Schoenberg Center in New York wrote a book called Condemnation of Blackness, 
DPA's report, Unjust and Unconstitutional, which talks about racist policing and how people of color and communities that are predominantly people of color, especially in NYCHA developments, have been targeted um, by policing. And Scott Stringer's report, Addressing the Harms of Prohibition, What New York City Can Do to Support an Equitable Cannabis Industry, are all literature that we have at, at our disposal um, that can be resources that we can use to understand how this criminal justice system is another form of slavery and how it is attacking and harming and devastating people of color, especially poor communities, and how we should move from the investment in Thank the you. criminal justice system, close Rikers, and invest in our communities. Thank you. Thank you. And your dad should be proud of you. And I want that list, by the way. So <laughs> I'm going to give you my email. I did read the new Jim Crow. I think I identified that. But Thank you. Yes, sir. You may begin. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Richards. My name is uh, Shane Karaya. I am the Deputy Director of Strategic Partnerships at the Center for Court Innovation, and thank you for allowing me to speak today. Uh, I'm here to request uh, the City Council's renewal support um, for the expansion work that we were granted last year. Uh, but as our work uh, expanded, so did the use of diversion programming in the state of New York, thanks to both closing Rikers as well as to various reforms in the criminal justice system. Um, for that, I'm here to talk a little bit about the needs that, that have created in terms of expansion and continuing to provide a high level of service within the communities we serve. And finally, because we are the Center for Court Innovation, I'm also here to talk about new programming ideas that we have regarding addressing more intensive issues such as mental health support for frequent repeat offenders and addressing gender-based violence. Regarding renewal, our City Council funded work, uh, we request continued um, renewals for our core funding that we received from the citywide speaker request, Project Reset, which operates citywide, driver accountability program, as well as our Brooklyn Felony Alternatives to Incarceration program, uh, the last two of which uh, began implementation last year, and we're excited to see the initial results. Regarding Project Reset, which is a low-level misdemeanor diversion program that works to ensure that individuals never have to go to a court to experience the collateral collateral consequences that were actually just referenced, uh, we've noticed that because of the new criminal justice reforms, the capacity that we were funded for was supposed to serve 13,000 13, individuals, but thanks to the new reforms and prosecutorial uh, welcoming of the program, uh, over, we're expecting over 19,000 individuals within the first year. Uh, in addition to that, because there is such a severe distrust of the NYPD within these communities, we've noticed that certain individuals do not give their information, and so they show up to court in time for their court date. However, they do not get to benefit from uh, pre-arraignment adjudication because of that distrust. We would like to pilot reset at arraignment so that they're not excluded from this opportunity to avoid the collateral consequences of their arrest. Additionally, we would also like to pilot a mental health court targeting individuals with over 30 convictions and or three arrests within a year so that they can receive consistent mental health support. Within the traditional system, they're cycling in and out, and we would like to give them consistent care with one judge and one team. Regarding Staten Island, we would like to take the models that have been successful in Manhattan, Brooklyn, and uh, the Bronx, and give our Staten Island judges a centralized opportunity to give their uh, clients or rather the defendants within their communities consistent access to alternatives to incarceration. Additionally, melding that provision of centralized court support with the Far Rockway and Brownsville model so that they're actually served within their community, but what they do within that community counts as part of their fulfillment of their mandate. Uh, regarding gender-based justice, and I see I have 15 seconds left, so I will speak very quickly. Uh, regarding gender-based justice, we would like to expand the work that we've been doing in our cure violence sites and focus on uh, IPV crimes similar to the way that gun violence is targeted. Where there's high crime, we would like to get those specific resources to the community. And in wrapping up, there is still one jail in Manhattan uh, that uh, has not closed down, and that's within our Midtown Community Court, uh, where we have a capital request to shut down the last three holding cells that we frankly have no use for because of the criminal justice reforms. So we've submitted that as a request so that we can utilize that space for community programming. So uh, that is essentially an overview of uh, the asks that we have, which have been informed by the 26 program directors that I work with who operate throughout New York City, serving the communities and over 77,000 individuals a year. And we see that number continuing to burgeon as people, as the city uh, continues to invest in diversion. So thank you for uh, this opportunity. Thank you. Right. Mr. Palladino. Ralph Palladino, Local 1549, DC 37. I'm here to talk about uh, the 911 uh, system in terms of staffing and also civilianization. 
uh, on civilianization, I mean, I'm sorry, on the 911 um, staffing first. Um, there were now 50 fewer um, PCTs, PCTs than there were as of February 1st. Um, the amount of overtime that is paid by the uh, NYPD for the 911 personnel is 10% of their salary. If you hire more PCTs, you can reduce and eliminate the overtime and hire 120 new PCTs without having to do the overtime. Um, it's pure math. Uh, more people are needed thanks to the texting and other things that you know about already. On the 911 surcharge, while they may be getting some money in the city for it, there's $186 million still sitting in the state, which could be asked for by the NYPD if they listen to us and work with us and the city. The city hall has to ask for that money. And we can get things like tr uh, buses from to and from the PSAC Center for safety reasons that I know you were helping us with. Um, and also um, we can get um, child care center that Mike Bloomberg closed down uh, for the NYPD uh, employees. In terms of civilianization, crime in nearly all categories is going, on, uh, going up according to a story in the New York Post. If this is the case, then why does the city and the NYPD allow 500, we say 500, able-bodied uniform officers to sit at desks performing routine clerical duties rather than be on the street keeping the public safe? This violation of three arbitrators' decisions costs the city $30 million a year. That's $180 million under the present administration if you go six years. Why does the city and the NYPD continue to waste tax dollars in such a way? The NYPD should civilianize immediately. Police officers, traffic, inform uh, sorry, traffic enforcement agents, and school safety agents are performing routine clerical duties at the desks. They are filing. They are greeting people coming into the precincts. You can see it in every precinct. Okay, uh, the, and the current administration is wasting money, 180 million, as I said before. Um, they say that there's 368 positions that could be civilianized. We say uh, 500, and it's police administrative aides. They have done some civilianization, but not of that title. The police civilianization aides are the ones that filed the grievance and won it, and they're being disrespected, as this local is, and all the people sitting on civil service lists waiting to come off that list that need jobs in this city. The mayor had promised us in 2017, and it hasn't happened yet. The, the city controller has said he would do an audit two years ago. It hasn't happened yet. What is going on in this city that people can waste money like that? It's absurd to have, last year, you, the city council put in for 100, 100 positions. The NYPD told the council that we couldn't do it because of, uh, we had a cut in, in the cler clerical uh, area. Why do they have the uh, police officers sitting there doing that work if there's a cut, if the work isn't needed? If it's autom automation, why are they still at the desks? Good question. A nice, it begs an answer. Thank you very much, and thank you for all you do. We know you've been helping us. I heard you earlier in the day as well. Thank you. Thank you. It's called overtime. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good evening, Chair Richards and committee members. So I won't read to you the testimony that you already have. Before you, I'll just highlight the high-level points. My name is Ashley Sawyer, and I'm the Director of Policy at Girls for Gender Equity. We've been serving the youth of, young, of New York City for close to 18 years now, and our commitment is to removing systemic barriers that prevent girls, including cisgender and transgender girls and non-binary youth of color from living self-determined lives. I want to hone in on two key points. The first point is the importance of reducing the contact that young people of color have with the New York City Police Department, including the School Safety Division, and putting a halt to the proposed, um, I won't even say proposed, the youth coordination plan that seems to be rolling out quite quickly. And second, the alarming growth in the city spending on criminal of girls of color. I want to note the second page of the testimony that you have before you includes uh, a graphic and a chart, and you'll see that the cost of the school safety division this year will be the most expensive that it has ever been. 
totaling at $451 million. And that kind of growth cannot go unchecked. We have to recognize the ways in which um, the growth of school policing has been harmful, particularly for girls of color. You'll see in the data that I shared with you that black girls experience extremely disproportionate rates of interactions with school police in New York City. And the same racial disproportionality that we see with stop and frisk and police interactions on the street, we see that same racial disproportionality in our schools. Um, the most important thing is that again and again, advocates have said, educators, students have said that they do not need more policing, more police interaction in order for them to feel safe. They want investments in the ample staff, non-law enforcement staff to support them for their educational needs, their mental health, their emotional needs, and they want resourcing for their schools. So the new youth coordination plan that the NYPD has been bragging about is quite alarming in that it proposes to bring more young people into the system, more young people into arrest, instead of moving away from young people having to have any interaction with the school safety division. And we wanna make sure that the, this body is doing everything it can to slow down and hopefully put a stop to this program. I've testified before this body before, um, when I was an attorney representing kids in this city who have been, had contact with the system, when I was in Queens, I had to watch um, surveillance video of one of my clients being dragged by five school safety agents. A young queer girl, um, she was tackled to the ground because she cursed at a teacher at a Queens high school. And the situation escalated because there were police presence and that would not have happened, I believe, had not police been involved in normal adult adolescent discipline. I'll wrap really quickly by noting that um, of the data that we shared with you, GGE found that black girls represented 57% of all school safety division in interventions that involve girls, but black girls are only 25% of the population in New York City um, schools. We recognize that the MOU that went into effect this year has not reduced the level of interventions. In addition, I want to make sure GGE, our history is doing the work of preventing sexual violence as it impacts girls of color. We're the institutional home of the Me Too movement. Um, we heard what the CCRB testified and we wanna make sure that you all are aware about the extremely high rate of sexual misconduct of school safety division. Um, rec uh, one of our young people testified here last year about feeling uncomfortable because of the sexual harassment that she and her colleagues, her other classmates experienced at the hands of school safety officers, whether it was inappropriate gestures, flirting, leering, all of that behavior has to be addressed, and we believe that young people should not have to interact with police as they're going through their normal maturation. Finally, I want to make sure you take a look at the most recent data that I shared with you about the extreme increase in the funding that's going to the school safety division and that's not being allocated towards the resources that students and families have been begging for. Thank you for your time, and I appreciate your consideration. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'm all right. Good evening, Chair Richards. Um, thanks for the opportunity to testify today. Um, my name is Brandon Holmes, New York City Campaign Coordinator with Just Leadership USA, leading the Close Rikers campaign. Um, today I want to highlight some of the opportunities that are right in front of New York City's eyes, but that we are currently not taking. To immediately invest in the types of community resources that can create true safety by strengthening and stabilizing our communities. Uh, Council Member Richards, I know you as a black man raising a family in New York City, you understand the narrative, the legacy that has been plaguing our communities for generations. Um, me as someone who went to PAL, the Police Athletic League camp out in Cambria Heights and Springfield, uh, I also know the neighborhoods that <laughs> you uh, have grown up in or have represented. Um, but today, uh, I want to focus on identifying other opportunities and other agencies that are overfunded and overstaffed, uh, one of them being the Department of Corrections. And we spoke a lot about, and you know, you all questioned a lot uh, the NYPD, but the Department of Corrections currently operating with over j just about 9,000 uniformed corrections officers with less than 5,500 people in their custody. This is almost a two to one ratio uh, of an agency that's operating with essentially a $2.5 billion budget. 
the Littman Commission has reported that we could save over a billion dollars just this year alone from the impact that reducing mass incarceration in New York City has had. Um, so that's, that's one pool of money, right, that we shouldn't be questioning where is this money coming from, right? We know that New York City is in a deficit, that there are cuts from the state that we are facing. There's no question of where this money is coming from. As crime last year was reported in all-time low, we've seen that over the past six, seven years. Uh, these budgets have continued to increase with the NYPD and with the DOC. And now, uh, in the face of this plan to get us below where our current jail population is, we have a real opportunity opportunity to talk about how we divest that money from these law enforcement agencies this year and next year. This isn't something that's going to happen in one budget cycle, which we're very clear about, uh, but this is a massive opportunity for council members and committee members to be using the cover of the closure of Rikers Island and the goal, the goal of closure by 2026 to begin setting New York City's budget on a path over the next several years to divest from those systems from punitive response responses uh, to crisis in our communities and invest in proven alternatives and solutions. Um, and you know, many of the folks here uh, who are engaged in service provision uh, spoke very well to that, and I want to uplift everything that they said. And I also want to name a couple of the things that are from our Build Communities uh, 2.0 platform. This is a platform that identifies there's $14 billion spread across New York City law enforcement agencies and different solutions and alternatives to investing that money directly in community resources and programs uh, that are not punitive or justice system responses. So one is creating paid opportunities for community members to learn and apply skills related to social and emotional support and civic engagement, such as conflict de-escalation techniques for themselves, their families, and neighbors. If there was that much effort put into training our community members as there is to retraining DOC several times over the past few years or retraining police officers to adopt new neighborhood policing models, we could actually address and confront violence in our communities before it got to the point uh, of reporting crimes. Uh, another thing I want to talk about is expanding funding for violence interruption programming to include civic engagement, mobilization, and political education, and the creation of youth public health workers. Uh, each site, uh, each violence interruption site that currently exists should receive at least $1.5 million for services, not including the cost of their space. Uh, and to be trusted and effective in their communities, these programs must have no affiliation with the police, right? In order for them to really uh, be the credible messengers that we seek and we need to confront violence or harm in our communities um, before incarceration and before people are trapped in the justice system, we need to make sure that we're doing the best to invest in these uh, community programs outside of police oversight. Um, so I will stop there and submit this to the record. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. Thank you. All righty, last panel, Jorge Artelojo. I think I messed that up. I chopped that up. Um, Tawaki Kamusu. This is Darlene Jackson, Bronx Community Board 9, Closed Rikers Campaign. Okay. Darlene, right? Okay, perfect. You may begin, sir. Can you hear me? Good. I come to uh, New York City from the American Southwest and um, listening to the uh, proceedings that preceded uh, my testimony here and that the others have spoken that um, it seems that New York is true blue and that um, in that case that it is that it's necessary in those instances in which there are concerns that the public necessarily might have with regards to the method by which that trueness in the blue is enforced, that it should be in fact addressed adequately. And um, fortunately for the city, they have avenues by which complaints can be addressed. But the problem, it seems to be that uh, individuals who have complaints for whatever reason, legitimate reasons that they might have for not proceeding with their complaints, they choose not to complain. 
And if they're not choosing to complain, then the complaint continues to exist. And if it's existing complaint, then the problem continues to exist and it manifests itself. And I hope that the city of New York undertakes efforts by which it can address those instances in which individuals are having difficulty complaining legitimately for those concerns to in fact alleviate those concerns so that those complaints that those individuals have are brought out and addressed so that New York can function in the light that New York exists and in fact functions the true blueness of the city. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, my name is Tawaki Komatsu. Um, we had a conversation prior to the start of today's hearing. I sent you an email last week asking if I could present video in conjunction with today's testimony. There has been no preparations made whatsoever to have that done. There's no laptop on the table. That would allow me to present that video recording for the benefit of the audience. So um, this hearing is about a budget hearing for the NYPD. Um, I previously talked to you about the fact I was facing a frivolous criminal prosecution. I prevailed in that prosecution without your, without your assistance um, in January of this year. Four months after I met that a-hole, um, he stopped an Uber car, didn't turn on his body camera video, and he's still a part of the NYPD. Um, the mayor's head of security, Howard Redmond, he, was, he had a federal court hearing earlier this week um, in a lawsuit filed by a member of his own team in a racial discrimination case. So the question is, in terms of budget, why in the hell should taxpayers foot the bill for the NYPD when they're violating the civil rights of military veterans sitting in front of you? Um, they're violating the civil rights of members of the mayor's NYPD security detail, and there's no oversight. Um, as a corollary, if earlier today there were a bunch, a bunch of other council members um, sitting to your left, your right, where in the hell are they? We have a due process right to be heard in this public hearing. So where is a hearing by um, Roy Lankman? Where is a hearing by Vanessa Gibson? Also, to close out, um, as I apprised you previously, I have a federal lawsuit against the city. Um, Judge Gabriel Gorenstein, he issued an order on March 2nd, asked me, in essence, what additional claims do I want to assert in my lawsuit against the city? So um, I testified to you on November 18th. I asked you if arrangements could be made to have video presented for the benefit of the audience. Um, three days after that hearing, the video from that hearing wasn't available online in accordance with New York City Charter 1063. So with regards to answering that question by Judge Gorenstein, what additional claims I seek to assert, um, I hope you enjoy being a defendant in that lawsuit. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. You may begin. Okay. <clears throat> uh, my name is Darlene Jackson, and I'm a member and supporter of the Close Rikers and Bell Communities Campaign. As the city begins the closure of Rikers Island and shifting to safer, smaller, and humane borough-based facilities to reach New York City's decarceration goals and a restorative approach, the culture of systemic violence as a result of poverty in this city needs to begin to shift and be treated as a public health crisis and not continue as a punitive system. We need our elected officials and city council to be bold and have the political courage to do the right thing and divest from the, and divest from the NYPD's five billion budget and invest in communities of color impacted by mass, mass incarceration and drastic, drastically eliminate the number of arrests through preventative services. And we can do that by creating a just transition to union jobs that meets the needs of New York City. Ending our city's culture of violence begins with addressing the historic disinvestment of resources in our communities that fills our criminal justice system because of poverty, the, for, the worst form of violence. The city for far too long has relied on our jails to warehouse people experiencing homelessness, mental illness, substance abuse, and untreated trauma. These issues are in are intensified by placing the responsibility on law enforcement, an agency that is not equipped to deal with our public health crisis and its root causes, and are simply trained to ensure safety and security. They are not properly trained in trauma-informed care that can support their own well-being as well. We have an opportunity now to reimagine what public safety truly means in New York City with a restorative justice lens that will allow everyone to live in dignity with their basic necessities met, regardless of race, class, and due process. I urge the City Council to invest in the, communities, in the community resources laid out by the Bills Community Platform, divest in law enforcement, and invest in resources that will better serve public safety and health, and health such as school counselors, crisis intervention teams, 
crisis respite centers, affordable housing, and affordable health care. It is time to move away from living in a punitive state and truly create a pathway, a pathway for New Yorkers to thrive. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. This concludes uh, the FY21 uh, preliminary budget hearing. Look forward to continuing to work with all parties, and I certainly agree uh, with a lot of your testimony. We have a lot of work to do to make sure we're investing in communities uh, and not just law enforcement because community-based solutions actually will drive down crime. So that being said, more work to be done. Thank you everyone for coming out. This hearing is now closed.